I'm going to call this meeting to order. Do we have any closed session reports? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No closed session reports. Okay. Uh, let's see. Karen, would you mind coming up and leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> Did I see? Karen, Karen, Karen. either one. Roll call, please. Council Member Litzter? Here. Council Member Kavanaugh? Here. Council Member Judge is absent this evening. Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes? Here. And Mayor Thomas? Here. Are there any items for agenda review? Seeing none. Mr. Mayor, I move that all resolutions and ordinances presented tonight be read in title only and all further reading be waived. Second. Call for a vote. The motion passes unanimously. If any member of the city council may have a conflict of interest or any reason why that member must abstain from consideration of any matter on this agenda, he or she should declare so at this time. Seeing none. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, the first item on the agenda is 1D1, presentation of an honorary resolution to the 2024 City Volunteer of the Year, and Acting Management Assistant Candace Gray is here to present the award to recipient Pete Stong. Good evening, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. Each year, staff from the City's various departments is asked to nominate some of the city's dedicated volunteers for one to be selected as the City Volunteer of the Year. Tonight, the City Council is recognizing the individual who has stood out as having a great impact over the past year as the 2024 City Volunteer of the Year. At this time, I would like to read an honorary resolution recognizing Pete Stong as the 2024 City Volunteer of the Year. Whereas, since its incorporation in 1969, the quality of life for citizens in the city of Simi Valley has continued to improve due to the significant contributions of the committed volunteers in our community. And whereas, over the last year, over 450 city of Simi Valley, city Valley, Simi Valley volunteers contributed over 30,000 hours to city departments facilities, programs, and services, and whereas the Simi Valley City Council established the City Volunteer of the Year Award to recognize a special individual whose outstanding service to the city represents our citizens' willingness to give back to their community, and whereas the City of Simi Valley recognizes these extraordinary volunteers in conjunction with National Volunteer Week which was established in 1974 to celebrate the impacts that volunteers have in communities across the United States. And whereas Pete Stong has been chosen as the City of Simi Valley's 2024 City Volunteer of the Year for donating his time and valuable input to the Simi Valley Council on Aging, Neighborhood Council Number Two, and serving on city committees. And whereas, Pete Stong has served on the Council on Aging Executive Board since 2018, advocating for Simi Valley seniors to ensure their maximum independence, safety, security, health, and quality of life. And whereas, Pete Stong has been the co-chair of the annual Council on Aging Wellness Expo for six years, using his extensive leadership experience to bring together information 
resources, and health screenings for older adults in one convenient event. And whereas Pete Stong has helped the Council on Aging raise tens of thousands of dollars from wellness expos, arts and crafts fairs, and other fundraising events to enhance the aesthetics of the center to create a welcoming and comfortable environment for seniors to socialize and remain active. Now therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Simi Valley that it hereby commends Pete Stong as the 2024 City Volunteer of the Year and expresses its sincere gratitude for his dedicated service to our community. Presented this 15th day. So congratulations, you've at least been busy, and we do appreciate your, your, all the efforts you've made on behalf of our city. Thank you so much. Um, I share this with uh, my family. Uh, I'm a mush pot, sorry. <laughs> but I uh, share this with uh, all my colleagues on the board of the Council on Aging, uh, the wonderful staff, including Candice and Raquel, who are here, uh, all the other volunteers, um, and also uh, uh, the, the other city people who work with the boards I've been on. Uh, Emily Habib, who's retired, but, and uh, Julia Ramirez, and uh, many, many, many others. Uh, I feel very fortunate to work with these people, and. Like I said, I'm very honored and humbled. Well, we have an amazing staff here in the city, and this is just another example of how, how, how good they really are. Congratulations again. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 1D2. Presentation of an honorary resolution to the 2024 Community Volunteer of the Year and Acting Management Assistant Candace Gray will present this item, will present this award to recipient Marie Bennett. Good evening again, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. Each year, the public at large is asked to nominate one dedicated volunteer to be selected as the Community Volunteer of the Year. Several nominations applauding the dedication, time, and talents of community members were received. Tonight, the City Council would like to honor an outstanding member of our community, Marie Bennett, as the 2024 Community Volunteer of the Year. At the <laughs> At this time, I would like to read an honorary resolution recognizing Marie Bennett as the 2024 Community Volunteer of the Year. Whereas, since its incorporation in 1969, the quality of life for residents in the city of Simi Valley has been greatly enhanced by the selfless contributions of committed volunteers. And whereas the Simi Valley City Council established a Community Volunteer of the Year Award to highlight the endeavors of an individual who is responsive to community needs and whose efforts embody the essence of volunteerism. And whereas Marie Bennett has been selected as the 2024 Community Volunteer of the Year for her estimated 15,000 hours of selfless service in leadership positions over the past 20 years. And whereas Marie Bennett is commended for the significant positive impacts she has made to support the arts and for encouraging collaboration among the public, 
private, and nonprofit organizations to improve the quality of life for residents of Simi Valley. And whereas, Marie Bennett has been a dedicated board member of the Simi Valley Cultural Arts Foundation for 17 years, including serving as president three times, vice president of membership, secretary, and serving on numerous fundraising event committees. And whereas Marie Bennett has been an invaluable member of the Simi Valley Chamber of Commerce, leaders, she's been a, of the Simi Valley Chamber of Commerce Leadership Steering Committee since she first participated in its leadership class 16 years ago, mentoring others and facilitating the ethics class. And whereas Marie Bennett consistently serves with humility, passion, dedication, and willingness to step, step up into any role needed at any time needed, exemplifying true volunteer spirit. And whereas Marie Bennett is an exceptional, exceptional example of community involvement and volunteerism, serving as a model and inspiration for others to follow. Now, therefore, it be resolved by the City Council of the City of Simi Valley that it hereby honors Marie Bennett as the 2024 Community Volunteer of the Year and expresses its sincere gratitude for her inspiring and tireless service to our community presented this 15th day of April, 2024. Well, it is absolutely my honor to present this to one of my favorite people in the entire world. <laughs> And I think you're about due for a vacation, aren't you? <laughs> okay. Thank you for everything you've done. And I know still will do. I mean, you're in the middle of planning an event right now. So but thank you for everything you do. You're amazing. You really are. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 1D3. Presentation of a proclamation declaring the week of April 14th through April 20, 2024 as Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. And Communications Manager Aaron Cooper is here to present this item. And accepting the proclamation is Holden Mayor. We're on. Okay. Good evening. Whereas National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week acknowledges and honors the men and women in this vital career whose knowledge and professionalism to make critical decisions, obtain necessary information, and quickly dispatch needed aid is so greatly relied upon. And whereas in an emergency, Americans depend on 911 and each and every day dispatchers answer desperate calls for help, responding with services that save the lives and property of citizens in need of assistance. And whereas these public safety dispatchers are more than anonymous voices on the telephone and radio, they are professionals who play a crucial role ensuring that public safety resources are deployed in an effective and timely manner to protect our citizens and community. And whereas the Simi Valley Police Department dispatchers serve our citizens daily and the work of those dedicated individuals in emergency situations is invaluable. And each of these men and women deserves heartfelt appreciation and honor. Now, therefore, April 14th through April 20th, 2024 is hereby proclaimed Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in the city of Simi Valley to show appreciation and to recognize the public's health, safety and well-being often depend upon the commitment and steadfast devotion public safety dispatchers have in serving our community. We count on them to answer the call 24 hours per day, seven days per week. Dispatchers, some, dispatchers are some of the most important people you may never see. They are the unsung heroes of public safety, presented this 15th day of April 2024.
Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. Here we go. Let's do it. This is a really important job, and it's a challenging job and a very stressful job. And I just want to thank you and the entire uh, crew over there at the dispatch center for the job you do day in, day out, every day of the year. Thank you. There you go. Good job. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 1D4, presentation of a proclamation declaring the month of April 2024 as Fair Housing Month. And Senior Management Analyst Cynthia McCullough is here to present this item. Uh, good evening, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. Uh, unfortunately, Margot Parker, who was going to receive uh, the proclamation on behalf of the Housing Rights Center wasn't able to make it tonight, so I'm just going to go ahead and move forward reading the proclamation. Whereas the city of Simi Valley is dedicated to providing all of its residents equal housing opportunities through the elimination of housing discrimination, and whereas April is the 56th anniversary of the enactment of the Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, and Whereas the Fair Housing Act forms a national policy of non-discrimination in the sale, rental, or negotiation for sale or rental of dwellings based on race, color, religion, gender, national origin, family status, or disability. And whereas the State of California's Fair Employment and Housing Act and the Unrest Civil Rights Act also protect California residents from housing discrimination based on age, ancestry, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, genetic information, source of income, military or veteran status, and other arbitrary basis. And whereas through a contract with the city, the Housing Rights Center provides a fair housing program to investigate and remedy illegal housing discrimination and counsel and educate housing consumers and providers alike, and whereas despite existing legislation, discrimination in housing continues to be a nationwide problem, necessitating vigorous education and enforcement efforts by the Housing Rights Center, with the city of Simi Valley being an active partner in those efforts. Now, therefore, the month of April 2024 is hereby proclaimed Fair Housing Month in the city of Simi Valley to encourage all citizens and civic organizations to continue support, supporting the principles of the Fair Housing Act, presented on this 15th day of April 2024. Oh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 1D5, presentation of a proclamation recognizing the observance of Arbor Day and declaring the week of April 15th through April 21 as Simi Valley Arbor Week. An associate planner, Zarui Shaparayan, is here to present this item. Good evening, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. We are delighted to announce that the Arbor Day Foundation has once again recognized the city of Simi Valley as a tree city USA. We are privileged to have a representative from the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection here tonight to present an award on behalf of the Arbor Day Foundation in recognition of our city achieving tree city USA certification for the 24th consecutive year. Now I would like to present this proclamation to the mayor and city council designating Arbor Week. Whereas, in 1872, the first Arbor Day was observed with the planting of trees, and whereas trees are a source of renewable energy, add value to the urban landscape, moderate temperatures, clean air, produce life-giving oxygen, and beauty, beautify our community, and whereas the city of Simi Valley is dedicated to enhance, enhancing pres and preserving the urban environment, and in recognition of its commitment has been named for the 24th year as a Tree City USA by the Arbor Day Foundation. 
And whereas the C Simi Valley City Council encourages residents and local businesses to support the expansion of the urban landscape by planting trees and observing Arbor Day on April 15, 2024, now, therefore, the week of April 15th through April 21st, 2024, is hereby proclaimed Arbor Week in the city of Simi Valley to urge all residents and businesses to plant trees to enhance the beauty of Simi Valley and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Presented this 15th day of April 2024. Next, we'd like to welcome Cal Fire Representative Derek Carlson to come up and present the city with the Tree City USA flag. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your city's Arbor Day observance. My name is Derek Carlson. I'm the Los Angeles and Ventura County's Regional Urban Forester for the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Arbor Day Foundation recognizes cities for their commitment to trees through the Tree City USA program. For a community to receive the Tree City USA designation, they must meet four fundamental components, a tree border department, a tree care ordinance, a community forestry program with the annual budget of at least $2 per capita, and an Arbor Day proclamation and observance. Since 2000, the city of Simi Valley has shown its dedication to restoring, enhancing, and maintaining your community's urban forest by meeting or exceeding the Arbor Day Foundation's Tree City USA standards. CAL FIRE supports and delivers the Tree City USA program on behalf of the Arbor Day Foundation. As a CAL FIRE urban forestry representative, it's a great pleasure to recognize Simi Valley city officials staff and partners for the hard work they do to improve the quality of life for their citizens. I'm honored to be here with you today to celebrate Simi Valley's Tree City USA designation for the 24th year. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Have a good Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 1D6, Presentation of a proclamation declaring the week of April 7th through April 13th, 2024 as Library Week and Deputy Community Services Director Anna Medina is here to present this item and accepting the proclamation are Assistant Library Director Stephanie Erb and Mobile Library Coordinator Mia Lopez. Good evening, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. We are very proud of our Simi Valley Public Library the service it provides to the public and its importance in our community. Whereas libraries offer the opportunity for everyone to connect with others, learn new skills, and pursue their passions no matter where they are on life's journey. And whereas libraries have long served as trusted institutions striving to ensure equitable access to information and services for all members of the community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status. And whereas libraries adapt to the ever-changing needs of their communities, developing and expanding collections, programs, and services that are as diverse as the population they serve. And whereas libraries are accessible and inclusive places that promote a sense of local connection, advancing understanding, civic engagement, and shared community goals. And whereas libraries play a pivotal, pivotal role in economic development by providing resources and support for job seekers, entrepreneurs, and small businesses, thus contributing to local prosperity and growth. And whereas libraries make cho choices that are good for the environment and make sense economically, creating thriving communities for a better tomorrow. And whereas libraries are treasured institutions that preserve our collective heritage and knowledge, safeguarding both physical and digital resources for present and future generations. And whereas Libraries are an essential public good and fundamental institutions in democratic societies 
working to improve society, protect the right to education and literacy, and promote the free exchange of information and ideas for all. And whereas libraries, librarians, and library workers are joining library supporters and advocates across the nation to celebrate National Library Week. Now therefore, April 7th through the 13th, 2024, is hereby proclaimed Library Week in the city of Simi Valley to show appreciation of and to recognize the vital role the Simi Valley Public Library and its staff play in our community. All residents are encouraged to visit the Simi Valley Public Library and celebrate the adventures and opportunities they unlock for us every day. Ready, Set, Library, presented this 15th day of April, 2024. Well, we have an amazing library. I don't know if you've been there lately. If you haven't, do so. I went over and got the complete tour, and I could not believe all the programs they offer there. No, we, we really do have an amazing library. So congratulations. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item two, public statements on appointments, special presentation, and informational reports. Mr. Mayor, we have no speakers for this item this evening. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 3A1, appointments to the Community Projects Grant Review Committee, and Senior Management Analyst Cynthia McCullough is presenting this item. Good evening again, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. The City Council created the Community Projects Grant Review Committee to review applications and provide funding recommendations to the City Council on the distribution of grant funding of up to $150,000. The review committee is comprised of seven representatives, one from each of the four neighborhood councils, the Youth Council, the Council on Aging, and the community at large. Each of the advisory boards nominated representatives at their regular March meetings and recruitment for the community at large member position began on February 16th and ended on March 1st. Mayor Thomas and council member judge conducted interviews on March 19th and nominated one representative. A total of seven nominees are being recommended to serve on the review committee with terms commencing immediately and concluding when the city council awards the fiscal year 24-25 funding. A few of the nominees are present this evening, so as I call your name, please come forward. Representing Neighborhood Council Number 1, David Mosso. Representing Neighborhood Council 2, Sam Cohen. Representing Neighborhood Council Number 3, Tony Hoodax. Representing Neighborhood Council Number 4, David Hetcher. Representing the Council on Aging, Jeannie Mortensen. Representing the Youth Council, Ethan Bott. And representing the community at large, Spencer Ross. It is recommended that the City Council approve and the Mayor appoint these seven nominees to the Community Projects Grant Review Committee. This concludes the report and staff is available to respond to any questions. Questions? Questions? I don't have any questions, but it's nice that you gentlemen are getting along so well because you've got a lot of work cut out together. This is not an easy task. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Would you like a motion? I move, I move to approve in the mayor appoint the seven nominees to the Community Projects Grant Review Committee with terms commencing upon appointment and concluding when the City Council awards the fiscal year 2024 2025 CPG funding. Second. The motion passes unanimously. 
Well, then consider yourself appointed. <laughs> Congratulations. Excellent. And thank you guys for you know committing the time that it's going to take to do this. It's not an easy choice. You're talking about a lot of community groups that are all you know in need and deserving, and uh, it can be challenging. I, I know you'll do a good job. This for you. Thank you so much. And congratulations. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 3A2, selection of one City Council member to serve on a selection committee with a continuing Arts Commissioner to interview and nominate prospective Simi Valley Arts Commissioners. And Deputy Community Services Director Anna Medina is presenting this item. Good evening again, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. On June 30th, 2024, the terms of service for three members of the Simi Valley Arts Commission will conclude. The Arts Commission is responsible for promoting greater public participation in and access to arts and culture, exploring alternate sources of arts <clears throat> and culture funding, planning arts programs and events, developing a master cultural plan, applying for grants, reviewing the annual financial and operational plans for the Simi Valley Cultural Arts Center, and reinforcing the arts as a vital, integral, and necessary component of life for all members of the community. Membership on the commission is comprised of eight members, two city council members, five city council appointed public members, and one Simi Valley Cultural Arts Center Foundation Board of Director. All public members serve staggered two-year terms of office. Arts Commission members may serve two consecutive terms and may serve additional terms provided 12 months have lapsed between appointments beyond two consecutive terms. The city initiated a recruitment on February 9, 2024 to fill these upcoming vacancies. A total of eight applications were received and all applicants attended an orientation. It is estimated that approximately one and one half hours will be needed to conduct the interviews. Staff is recommending that the City Council select one City Council member to serve on a selection committee with a Continuing Arts Commissioner to interview and nominate applicants to serve in the Arts Commission for appointment by the City Council. Council Member Litster last served in this capacity in May of 2023. This concludes the report and staff is available to answer any questions at this time. Mayor Pro Tim Rhodes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. While it would be in my nature to nominate the person who's not here tonight, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think Councilwoman uh, Litster did an ex uh, excellent job last time. We'd be happy to nominate her again for this position. Second. I would be happy to do it. It's an honor. All right, let's call for a vote. The motion passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 3A3, selection of City Council members to interview and nominate prospective Neighborhood Council Executive Board members. And Community Services Coordinator Kelly Duffy is here to present this item. And just for one moment, for the council members who have not yet had the opportunity to meet one of our newer members of our team, I just want to take a second to introduce Kelly Duffy, who came to us from a career in education at all grade levels and is now assigned to our Neighborhood Council program and is doing a wonderful job. So Kelly will present staff's report. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. Neighborhood Council Executive Board members are appointed to alternating two terms, two-year terms, with approximately one-third of the seats expiring every eight months. The next term of appointments is scheduled to commence on J July 1st, 2024. A general recruitment to fill 22 positions was initiated on February 29th, 2024 and concluded on March 29th, 2024. 
A total of 37 applications were received during the recruitment period. Subsequently, one application has been withdrawn. The application count was 14 for Neighborhood Council 1, 6 for Neighborhood Council 2, 7 for Neighborhood Council 3, and 9 for Neighborhood Council 4. In previous recruitment cycles, the City Council has selected two subcommittees, each consisting of two City Council members. Staff is recommending that the City Council select four Council members to serve on two subcommittees of two City Council members to interview and nominate prospective Neighborhood Council Executive Board members. This concludes the report and staff is available for questions. Councilmember Litzker. Oh. oh no, I, thank you. I just want to know what um, Councilmember Kavanaugh is doing that she's attracting so many applicants for her district. <laughs> I hope it's for good reasons. Yes. <laughs> I saw that. Was with, like, for, mm. with 14 applicants. No, I, actually, thank you for sharing this. So the one that dropped out, is that number still represented here or is that? Um, we have 36. It was 37. Got so. it. So the 36 yes. includes. So this yes. is. Um, and I, last time, as I recall, we each basically served together and, and were interviewing some of within our own district. We could do that again or not, whatever is the pleasure of this group. I actually like meeting the constituents in my group, mm -hmm. if, if, that, if people are okay with that. I was going to say the that. same thing, that yeah. we, we had good results in this last one, and, and why not again? Okay. All right, well, if, uh, I mean... I but, that like being, but that being said, if the, you want to do mics? my spot? Okay, take my Unless Mike, Mike really wants to do it. I, uh, I'll do it with you, Mr. Mayor. You can do one and two with me. Oh, one and three. All right. One and, well, all wait, right. wait, sorry. You're when, three. I'm three. He's two. But, it's, but we can do whatever you, do, whatever you want a motion. It's confusing. So I would like to um, propose that Mayor Thomas and I do neighborhood councils one and two. And count, Mayor Pro Tam Rhodes and Council Member Elaine Litzter do three and four. Second. Sounds good. Okay. Call for a vote. The motion passes <laughs> unanimously. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 3A4, selection of two City Council members to conduct Simi Valley Cultural Arts Center Foundation board interviews. And Deputy Community Services Director Anna Medina is presenting this item. Can't get away from us, Anna. <laughs> Good evening again, Mayor Thomas and members of the City Council. The Simi Valley Cultural Arts Center Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides endowment and an annual financial support for the Simi Valley Cultural Arts Center. The foundation board is comprised of up to 21 voting members, including seven City Council appointed public members. Currently, four City Council appointed vacancies exist with terms beginning on July 1st, 2024, <clears throat> and concluding on June 30th, 2028. Also, a city council appointed member resigned after the recruitment was initiated. Therefore, an additional vacancy exists to fill the remainder of the term beginning July 1st, 2024, and concluding on June 30th, 2026. The city initiated a recruitment that concluded on March 29th, 2024, a total of seven applications were received, and staff estimates that approximately one hour will be needed to conduct the 10-minute applicant interviews. Staff is recommending that the City Council select two City Council members to interview and nominate five applicants to fill the vacancies on the Foundation Board. Council Member Kavanaugh served on the nominating committee for the Foundation Board in October of 2022. This concludes the report, and staff is available to answer any questions at this time. Councilmember Lister. Got to turn my mic on. I apologize. I noticed that with the Cultural Arts Foundation, it's a four-year term, and the Cultural Arts Commission is a two-year term. And maybe because it's on the agenda tonight, I just thought that was interesting. Is there a reason why the terms are so different? They're, I realize they have different functions. Just wondered if you wanted to opine anything. I think the foundation was set up as a non, it's a 501c3 organization, and mm -hmm. they had set their own bylaws to set the terms. 
the commission is city committee where we set the terms. That's uh, that's a good thank you. And and, is, and then are there any other city commissions that are longer than two years? I know neighborhood council. Everything seems to be two years. Is that? Um, not that I'm aware of. Although the the community project grants committee you just said only exists every, as long it, as the every year. It's a it's a yeah yeah. Sure. So as long as the committee is a got active. it. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, I commend Dee Dee for doing it last year. I wondered if if Mayor Pro Tem um, Rocky Rhodes would like to be the sit on that committee this year. I was going to nominate Mike. But oh, you can. No. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> you go right ahead. <laughs> no, I'd be happy to sit on that. Yeah, no. we're looking for two, correct? You need two. Oh, you need two. I. How about Mike? Since he didn't get to do neighbor councils. Come. Is it all right to nominate someone who's not here? And uh... actually, I actually kind of wanted to do this one this year. Okay, let's, there you go. All right. Let's nominate the mayor. Yeah. Right. Right. So I move so, the mayor and I, mayor, uh, I guess I, um, <laughs> fine, uh, uh, sit on this committee for what is it? <laughs> We're doing for the, uh, the Cultural, Center, Arts Foundation. Cultural Center for Arts Foundation. Second. Call for a vote. The motion passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 3B1, presentation by Interface Children and Family Services Executive Director Eric Sternad on their two-in-one department and services. Okay. Good evening, uh, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Members, uh, um, City Manager Gabler and staff. Um, proud CME resident, 17 years before you today, 17 years with Interface. I'm really pleased to be back to uh, talk with you again about 211 and update you on our recently released 2023 numbers. So, um, uh, 211 Venture County is a program of Interface Children and Family Services. <laughs> where we are connecting residents across the, across the county to any kind of health and human service that they may need. Um, and this is connecting folks to over 2,000 separate resources that are available for, uh, for residents of CME and the rest of the county. Um, in, in 2023, for some context, we did uh, help about 70,000 folks across the whole county. Um, via either call, text, or uh, unique searches. And there were over 121,000 uh, searches for, for resources that folks were looking, uh, looking for. We see this as a really critical way to make sure that the, uh, that the services are efficiently delivered. Um, it's great to have services available, but if folks can't get to them, well, then, then it's really wasted uh, money and effort, isn't it? So connecting people to those resources is really so critical. Uh, so the 2-1-1 program is uh, one of uh, a number of programs at Interface. Um, so, and we think this is really a part of what makes the 2 one service very robust. We know about mental health services. We know about families that are struggling with violence or domestic violence or uh, youth who are uh, struggling in crisis um, or folks who are in uh, and coming out of the justice services system. So this really helps to infuse some of that knowledge into our two-on-one staff. We have a lot of great uh, cross-training that happens. So it just gives you an idea of uh, the fact that the two-on-one service at Interface is really embedded in a broad organization with my 200 colleagues uh, at Interface who are doing amazing work uh, every day. And I have the privilege of uh, talking about their great work. So 211, uh, again, is, uh, is an easy to remember three digit number. Uh, it is um, connecting folks to resources as you'll see, which way should I point the pointer? Is it it's over here? 
Okay, there we go. Great, thank you. Um, so you'll see the types of uh, general resources that are available. Folks call us in crises. Um, there are educational resources, food, housing, free tax preparation is a great program that is just now uh, wrapping up on tax day um, that we do with the United Way of Ventura County. Healthcare and of course housing is uh, is the big one um, uh, that uh, that folks are asking uh, uh, us continually about. Um, so in any any member of the public, certainly CME residents, can reach two on one uh, day or night by calling the three digit number, texting their zip code to eight nine eight two one one, and about about two to three thousand people a year are choosing to just do that texting engagement with us. Um, or anybody can visit the 2 one venturaorg website. And we do publish a live Power BI uh, report of all of the data. So any member of the public or the council or, or you can direct staff to go there and drill down to really look into the more specific detail about what kinds of things CME residents are asking for. Um, and we also track what uh, um, is unavailable so, so this would be when uh, a resident is asking for a service that doesn't exist in our county or in the city, um, or maybe it's a service that exists, like say um, support for uh, rental assistance, but it runs out very early in the, each month. And so it, it, it ends up beco becoming what we call an unmet need. Um, that's also, I think, interesting to look at from a policy perspective in terms of, of where um, uh, could you think about directing you know, future resources uh, if, you, if you had the opportunity in the future. So just looking specifically at Simi Valley, uh, we talked to 11, uh, I'm sorry, 1,900 um, uh, residents in 2023, and this was really the kind of the breakdown of some of the key things that I think were notable from our perspective. First time callers, 660. Um, mostly uh, folks find their way to 211 through uh, uh, friends and family, word of mouth. Nonprofits are also referring people to call to 211. As, uh, as a method for broadening out the types of, sor uh, of resources that they might be able to find. Uh, about 200 families with children under five, um, about 40 persons in, uh, who are pregnant. Um, you see the, then the last two really about housing and homelessness, 163 meeting that HUD definition of at risk of homelessness uh, and uh, 211 currently homeless looking for shelter, looking for services uh, to support them. And so these are all uh, Simi Valley residents. Then when you look at the breakdown of these uh, types of services, this is just another, another view uh, looking at it. Of course, you'll see that housing requests are far and away the largest request from Simi residents. This is mirrored across the entire county. So there's not really that much difference in terms of, uh, of this, of this uh, a kind of breakdown of types of, of issues and needs that people have in CME versus the, the county uh, as a whole. Um, next, you see uh, income support and assistance, then individual family and community supports uh, that might be available, utility assistance, and mental health substance use disorders. Uh, that is, um, uh, uh, again, as I said, a fairly typical kind of breakdown across the county. So, of course, we've been seeing housing as the number one requested area for support for over a decade since we've been really collecting this data uh, in the same way, um, and, um, and it's happening across the county. So that's just, uh, I, think, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. So then uh, there are a few special projects that two-on-one is doing. Um, and if there are, you know, 70,000 folks who are just trying to reach 211 every year, it's, it's a great just sort of wide open funnel for having the, the community come in to find resources that they may need. So we've been able to launch several special projects. Um, we are in a project with the, count, with the uh, state public health department for a, a tobacco cessation program called Kick It California. And we have some of the best outcomes that actually rival healthcare in terms of being able to both find people who are willing 
to go into a smoking cessation or a tobacco ces cessation program. And the population that we work with is younger, harder to reach, and, and more complex, the state tells us. So we're really proud of that program. It's really helping people to, uh, to get off of tobacco products and, and is leading to uh, more health generally uh, in our community. We also spearheaded a project uh, and now a multi-year contract with, with Southern California Edison <coughs> and, um, and uh, PG&E. And when I say we, that was an interface uh, thing that we did to uh, establish these contracts. We're now in our third year. Uh, we started out uh, addressing just the public safety power shutoffs. So whenever a community is de-energized, then we're able to then help those vulnerable families who may need support during that uh, kind of a crisis period for them. You know, for, for those of us who have resources, that moment, well, we can get a hotel room or stay with a friend or something like that. For resource-constrained families, someone who may have sensitive medication that needs to be refrigerated, these can be very, seri very serious moments for them. So in this instance, we would be supporting them. The public utilities were so happy with the response that we've been doing for them that they've now widened that out to be any time there is a, a power uh, outage, um, they're asking 211 to come in and help support. And we recently got some information from PG&E saying that the third top reason why the public calls the, the PG&E or, or, or visits the PG&E website is actually to reach 211, which is actually pretty interesting. We do a program called California versus Hate. It's a hate crime reporting uh, project that comes out of the uh, 211 LA, our partners in 211. And so it's, it's now across the whole state. And so here is just a safe place for folks to call in any kind of, uh, of, a, uh, of an incident that may rise to the level of a hate crime. And then we can help folks to those kinds of legal resources and other resources of support in their community. You might be interested to note that, uh, that about a third of all of the resources that we send folks to, folks are unable to get to them because of transportation barriers. So this is a huge, huge problem in terms of, again, being able to f efficiently use all of the services that as taxpayers we are, we are paying for. And so we, in partnership with 211s across uh, Southern California, um, do what's called a 211 ride program. So this is a, this is a one trip, uh, one click trip planning tool to help residents be able to navigate what is actually a pretty complex uh, transportation system in our county. So imagine you have a job, you, you, um, you, 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 get, you get in your car Sunday night, and you realize, wow, the car's not working. I'm not gonna be able to make it to work on Monday. Never used the bus before. Um, this is the perfect example of getting to two on one. We help people figure it out so that they can get to work Monday, keep the trains running, if you will, keep the income going. And, um, and so that's been a great, uh, great service that we've been able to uh, provide for a couple of years now. So uh, just a quick stat uh, about uh, the hate, uh, the two on one versus uh, hate program. Um, about a 40% increase in, in hate crimes in Ventura County from 20 to 21. So it is something that is happening. It's happening at an increased uh, level. And so this is a great resource for our, our residents uh, in county. So happy to answer any other questions. This is uh, in your packet. Uh, this is uh, any of the contact information that folks might need to reach myself, Kelly Brown, our community information officer, or Lohana Al Almanza, who is our uh, 211 director. So uh, thank you again for your support of 211 um, and, uh, and happy to answer any questions you may have. As Mayor Pro Tem, he's, he's allowing me to speak. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation, and thank you for being a CME resident. Mm -hmm. um, I, my pleasure. I, I confess, as you were starting, I, I, I realized my own ignorance. <clears throat> I, was, I spoke at a group last week, and for some reason I thought it was 611. There's not anything else. 211 is the correct Ventura County three-digit. That's right. You need help. There's no other something 11. It is. Yeah. Well, there are different uses of the different N11 Obviously, obviously there's 911. There's 911 for okay. emergencies. 211 for any health and human service. Okay. And now there's 988, which is a which is a mental health and suicide crisis line. So okay. those are kind of the three most uh, popular, most used three-digit numbers. I think the telcos use the 611 number. 
um, 811 for calling before you dig in the ground and and okay. uh, 511 is used by some communities for traffic assistance, uh, things like Very that. Very good, but, but 211 but the is... the three big ones, we think, are 911 for emergencies, 211 for any health and human service, and 988 for yeah. any okay. kind of uh, mental health crisis or suicide crisis. Okay, yeah. I, I appreciate that. Another follow-up question. The, in, initially in your presentation, you said there were 70,000 um, inqu- uh, re- questions or inquiries or... or that's right. Unique people who Unique are reaching people. out to two on one in one way or another, right? And then you gave the figure that there's one thousand nine hundred and eleven at Simi Valley. That's right. So my math, suge- I mean, out of seventy thousand, does that mean that it's Simi Valleyans are underutilizing the service, or is there? Or can I not compare as apples and oranges? Well, um, again, I think you know different communities are going to respond in different ways. There's different levels of need. Generally speaking. Um, uh, you know, and we've tracked this, these numbers over time. Oxnard has the highest rate of seeking uh, resources through 211, uh, Ventura, City of Ventura second, and then CME is, is typically third. So there's, there, so that, that's been true over time. Um, I think there's uh, undoubtedly more folks who could get benefit from the services that are available. So we appreciate the chance to be able to speak with you, highlight this, so if you, do have those opportunities to, whenever I am out in the public, I'm just telling people, look, this is just a great resource for you. It's free. Um, and um, and we've had surprising uh, answers from folks who you wouldn't expect are looking for resources. Maybe it's a neighbor in need. They're saying to them, or maybe you encounter someone who is homeless on the street. People are not sure what to do. Make sure they know about the 211 yeah. number. And it's staffed 24 hours a day. Staffed 24 hours a day. That's right. Where is it physically staffed? Just out of curiosity. We have uh, our our main con- um, our main uh, contact center is in our office in Camarillo in the nonprofit building there with the Ventura County Community Foundation, and then we have some of our staff located remotely, so they're working from homes, which is really also helpful during a disaster because it sort of spreads resources out. We can be more nimble that way. We um, have maintained uh, contracts with uh, currently about 30 other counties. So they're also sending their traffic to us. So the total traffic in our contact center is more, is in the range of 250 to 300,000 calls a year. And the reason why this is actually of great benefit to us, say for example, the Thomas fire. When the Thomas fire hit, we were able to deploy all of those staff just to work on our own crisis uh, here and disaster here. And that's kind of the deal we have with all of our county partners. If anybody's in an emergency, they get sort of the full resources. Usually those only last for a day or two. Um, And uh, so it is a way for us to have a very robust disaster response capability, but not have to pay for it every day, right? right. Well, now you've brought up a couple more questions with sure. that. <laughs> and I appreciate that. So I don't know if you call it, does, that, does it work conversely? So for instance, someone calls in need of um, addiction, immediate service to, to go into some kind of a addiction recovery, sure. um, and the beds are filled in Ventura County, there's nothing available. Can you also... Re- turn them to other counties that maybe have availability. Absolutely. And and in fact, um, the resources that we have, those 2,000 or so resources that we have in our, in our resource database, those would consist of county-based resources delivered by the county or nonprofits, sometimes even faith-based organizations. Those also would be connections to state programs or federal programs, as there may be uh, support there. But then 211s all work very closely together. Um, And so if there's a service in Santa Barbara County or service in Ventura or in uh, in L.A. County, then, yes, we're we're always working with each other and we can search those databases quickly. We understand how to get through them very fast in a call and we can uh, direct someone there or we may uh, direct someone to contact the 211 in those counties. Um, if uh, if they need uh, to to make that connection directly themselves, okay. And we do refer folks to nine one one. We have nine one one referring folks to us. We can either do a warm handoff, uh, we can do a direct transfer. Or we can encourage people to hang up and then dial nine one one if we feel like we want to make sure that nine one one has their location, uh, which Got would it. only happen when they call directly. Got it. Okay. Last question, if, if that's all right. Um, 
I'm just trying to, I'm still wrapping my head around 1,911 Simi Valley people have called versus 70,000 for Ventura County. Um, is that based on self-identification? Do they say where they're calling from? Or is there a way of tracking based on, obviously it used to be able to do with landlines, now we're all cell phones, who knows where that comes yeah. from. Yeah. Um, actually, let me just clarify that because um, that would just represent the calls, not the web searches or or the text. And so when you talk about just calls, that would be about two, uh, a 20,000 calls specifically across the county of which Simi would be. That helps. Okay. And then 70,000 so is all contacts. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Right. That. Sorry about that. No, no. I'm understanding better now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you for that follow-up question, because that's where I was going to go, too. Yes. But uh, I have a little more structural question, because sure. I had to ask city manager, I actually thought this was a county program. Uh, <clears throat> that it was a, a county run, but it is not. Correct. Could you explain the, the structure and the funding? And, sure. Uh, and yeah, happy to, yeah. So 211s are actually um, established by the California Public Utilities Commission, the CPUC. So they establish an entity in every county that takes the responsibility and, and is exclusively able to answer that three-digit number. So that's us in our county. We were actually were the first county up and running with a 211 in California um, uh, about 17, eight, uh, 19 years ago now. So um, uh, so it is, uh, 211 is operated usually by nonprofits. Uh, about half of them operated by United Ways, when you look across the entire country. There's a few cities or a few counties that might run a two-on-one. The state of Texas runs its own for the entire state, like a single entity. Um, but, but typically, it's, it's nonprofits that are, that are running uh, those and, uh, and therefore responsible for the fundraising. So the funding uh, for our 2-on-1 in Ventura County is um, the, the, the largest funder is the county itself, about 100 and, um, let's see, 135,000 a year, something like that. The cities and the county got together uh, in 2009 and agreed to a uh, kind of a matching or sort of a shared revenue model. Um, and so it took a few years for all of the cities to come on board, but the cities are funding at around 100,000 altogether. When you talk about the 10 major cities in, in Ventura County, and then we're receiving funding from some of the specialized programs that we have that add to the funding mix. Uh, and again, because we are serving so many counties, we can uh, we have a, a a real efficiency at this scale that then really keeps the cost uh, cost pretty reasonable. And in Ventura County, how many? Uh, well, I'm assuming s some of the staff might be volunteers, but are uh, actually we don't we don't typically use volunteers. The work is um, kind of too complicated for volunteers to really grasp uh, quickly. Um, so uh, so we just use f uh, paid staff. And uh, so any call that might come into the contact center will be going to any staff member that is trained up in Ventura specific resources. So we sort of bring people on different counties uh, based on their sort of skill set. So how many people does it take to answer 120,000 interactions? Well, um, in terms of the entire uh, call center, we have about 55 uh, staff that are just de dedicated to the 24-hour uh, call handling. Again, to handle, that's 250,000 to 300,000 calls a year. Um, I had uh, one specific question because you talked about sort of data mining, and I like that mm -hmm. idea and didn't know we had that ability. Absolutely. Is there, uh, you mentioned you might discover services we don't have. Is there services that Simi Valley doesn't have uh, readily available for our folks? Um, well, again, the, definitely when it comes to um, housing, that would, uh, the numbers of requests for housing come in uh, outstrip the available resources. And again, that's, that's true in every city across the county. It's obviously a major problem in many, in many states even. Um, so uh, what I think is interesting, and after I did, I did a presentation to Moore Park City Council a couple weeks ago, we got a, we got a call 
a couple of days after from their staff saying, help us to walk through this and so we can be able to do this data mining ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's why we put it uh, in that Power BI uh, format so that you can drill down and you can look at specific months of the year, compare CME versus the whole county, uh, drill down just certain types of needs that folks are asking for. There is a national taxonomy that we use. It's kind of like the Dewey Decimal System, uh, thinking about the library uh, recognition. Um, it's kind of the Dewey Decimal System of 211s, and there are 10 major categories that are then broken out into 10 subcategories. So there's, a, there's a, quite a lot of detail to that, and that is replicated across the country. So it is possible for us to compare like cities, like states, et cetera, with each other. Well, that's all my questions, but thank you for that service and the presentation. I learned a You're lot. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. I'm just curious what we can do to help promote this to our citizens. Uh, awesome question. Well, I think any opportunity that you have in the public to, uh, to encourage the public to use the service would be wonderful. We have rack cards available. We have uh, little business cards that we have given out to law enforcement uh, to be able to use so that they can kind of, you know, hand a card out, get on to their next call, and, uh, and let us sort of do some of that kind of cleanup work in terms of connecting folks to resources. So those are great uh, avenues. Um, and uh, if there's any other way that you want to promote the 211 uh, connection on the city website, we're more than happy to, uh, to help out with that too. So those would be a couple of ideas. Great. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you so much. Very interesting. All right. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 3B2, presentation by Linda Narciso, audit partner with Vasquez and Company LLP regarding the annual audits completed for fiscal year 2022-23. And Deputy Administrative Services Director Marvin Lopez is here to present this item. Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, on an annual basis, the city publishes a complete set of financial statements presented in conformity with generally accepted accounting principles and audited in accordance with generally accepted government auditing standards by a firm of licensed certified public accountants. Our annual report for fiscal year 2023 is on the consent calendar later tonight for acceptance. Financial statements provide information about operations cash flows, assets, and liabilities that account for the government's management and use of funds. Financial reporting serves as a link between our government's financial information and our city council, creditors, and taxpayers. Tonight, our audit firm has joined us and will be making a presentation regarding the fiscal year 2023 annual report and related audits. Please welcome Linda Narquisco, Narquiso, audit partner at Vasquez & Company, LLC. Thank you, Marvin. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor, um, members of the Council. I'm happy, my first time being here in the city. Um, it's a very nice city hall. Um, so this, uh, this evening, I'll be presenting the results of our audit covering the year ended June 30, 2023. For the agenda, I'll introduce the audit team, uh, discuss the scope of the services that we provided, talk about independence, which is a requirement for all auditing firms, uh, and then I'll go with the summary of audit results that would cover the financial audits, um, the single audit, as well as uh, provide you some financial reporting highlights. Um, I'll end with a required communication with the city council or uh, those charged with governance. Uh, we've also included some um, lists of accounting pronouncements that will be effective for, for the city next year in the coming years. Um, but it'll be more for information purposes as um, based on the list, uh, there won't be any significant accounting standards that would affect um, the city moving forward. So for the engagement team, so we did a rotation um, to give a fresh eyes to, to the audit. Um, last year, I was acting as the quality control partner Christy was acting as the engagement partner for the, for the audit, so we switched roles this year. So now I'm the engagement partner leading the, the audit with Christy acting as the quality control partner, reviewing all the reports uh, prior to it being issued. 
to make sure that we conform with GAAP or generally accepted accounting principles uh, before we issue any final report. Um, assisting me is Rhoda Daloga. Um, she's the audit manager. And there's also another IT audit manager um, that, what, that led the IT general controls testing. So that's something that we perform uh, on behalf of the city. And of course, we have seniors and staff um, assisting both the financial auditors and the IT auditors. As far as the scope of services, it's nothing new. Um, it's the same scope as the previous year. Uh, we were um, hired to perform an audit of the city's basic financial statements. Um, we also performed um, IT general controls assessment of, of the city. While we're not, of course, opining on um, the IT general controls, but it, we looked at um, the controls for the city. And then something new this year, um, I think this is the only addition to the scope this year, is we are opining on the OPEB trust fund. So we're issuing a standalone financial statements for the trust fund. Um, single audit, because the city expended more than 750,000 federal expenditures for the year, um, the city is subject to single audit, and we perform that single audit in accordance uh, with the uniform guidance. And of course, we are available for any year, um, any accounting questions, te technical questions uh, from the city management. For independence, uh, we just want to confirm that our firm and all the, the entire engagement team assigned to the audit of the city, that we are independent of the city and we comply with the independence requirements of the government auditing standards. So I'll go to the summary of audit results. So first is the financial statement audit. Um, same as in the previous years, we're opining, we're issuing unmodified, um, unmodified opinion on your financial statement. So this means it's a clean opinion. This is the best opinion that any organization can get. This is what any organization would strive to get from, from your auditor. When we say unmodified opinion, it means your financial statements fairly presents in all material respects, your financial position, the results of operation, cash flow, um, co as of and for the year ended June 30, um, 2023. Um, since we are performing our audit in accordance with government auditing standards, we are also issuing a second opinion. This is on the internal controls over financial reporting. While we are not opining on the internal controls, when we are performing the audit, we, um, we look at your internal controls as a basis for designing audit procedures. And if we notice any material weakness or significant deficiencies that needs to be reported to those charged with governance, then we will be reporting that. Um, the good news is uh, while we were performing our audit, there were no material weakness or significant deficiencies noted. As far as the single audit, uh, for, for the year ended June 30, 2023, we audited three major programs. Um, that's ALN 14218, which is a fund coming from HUD. So the CDBG um, grant amounting to uh, 662,000. Another grant coming from the Department of Transportation, ALN 2205, which is the Highway Planning and Construction. The total expended fund is 1.2 million. And the last one is coming from the Department of Finance um, related to the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Um, the total expended fund is 5.3 million. The city is classified as a low risk oddity meaning in the past two years, um, there was no material weaknesses noted. Um, the opinion issued was unmodified opinion and there's no going concern issue for the city. Um, for As far as the results of the audit, again, as far as the financial statement is concerned, there's no audit findings. The federal awards, we are also issuing unmodified opinion, meaning you comply uh, with the requirements of the federal awards. 
and there were no um, prior year financial statements and federal awards findings that we need to look at and review the corrective action plan uh, prepared by the city. Any questions so far? Am I moving fast, slow, it's fine, <laughs> thank you. So I'll go with the financial reporting highlights. Uh, first with the government-wide financial statements. So these are your governmental activities and business type activities. And when we say government-wide financial statements, these are the financial statements that was prepared on the full accrual basis, something that you could compare to maybe a private company. Um, overall net position of the city as of um, June 30, 2023 was 452.3 million, which increased uh, by 29.5 from the previous year. So um, a very good um, results from the city. Uh, it means that your total revenues exceeded your total expenditures for the year. Um, if you compare your expenditures uh, year to year, uh, it basically went down by, a by over a million dollars. Um, although there was a reduction in the charges for services, some reduction in the operating grants, um, there was increases in your property taxes revenue. Uh, investment income also was uh, significantly better than the previous years. The previous years you were investment loss, but because the market condition was better in 2023, it was an, an in income of 4.5 million um, in 2023. So overall, um, it, revenue was flat, but you have enough revenue to absorb the increase in operating expenses. So for your uh, citywide expenses, um, it was 155 million versus 148 million the previous year, so an increase of 7 million, mainly because of the increase in pension expenses and some increases in salaries and benefits um, for 2023. Um, I think I want to highlight here is in your overall net position, your unrestricted funds or your unrestricted net position, it used to be a deficit of 11.2 million. But uh, because of your good uh, performance results in 2023, it is now a positive 13.5 million. So pension and OPEB liability uh, it significantly increased um, in 2023. So from 2022, the net pension liability was 98.6 million. It increased to 165.7 million in 2023. And your net OPEB liability from 62.3 million increased to um, 83.7 million. So the increase was really mainly one. There was a change in assumptions um, made by CalPERS. So the discount rate um, re was re reduced. So in 2022, they were using a discount rate of 7.15 they change it to 6.9. So anytime you have a decrease in discount rate um, in the calculation of pension liability, it would increase your liability. And um, the measurement period uh, for, for in the use for the calculation of the net pension liability was um, 2022. That, that was when the market wasn't really performing well. So that also, um, reduce the plan asset, and then therefore increasing your pension liability and net OPEB liability. Okay. As far as the fund level, so this is where the governmental fund, the special revenue fund um, is located. So total um, governmental fund expenditures for 2023, was around 99.4 million versus um, last year of 85.1 million. So the increases was really mainly due to higher salaries and expenses and benefits um, for uh, 2023. Um, general fund general fund increased by 3.3 million during the year. So from 76.7 million in 2022 to 80 million 
in 2023. It was also positive when we compared that to the budgeted um, general fund. So the projected um, ending fund balance for the general fund was 69 million when the actual was around 80 million. So this was, this was mainly um, due to the overall expenditures were lower. The actual expenditures were lower than what the city budgeted for 2023. As far as um, the enterprise fund is concerned, so this is your business funds, the transit, the waterworks, um, the sanitation. So overall, um, it generated revenue before contributions and transfers of 7.6 million. Um, waterworks was a positive 4.3 million, I mean. The sanitation also a positive 9.2 million and Transit's fund, however, made a loss of 5.9 million. But if we add, uh, especially for the transit, transit Fund, if we consider the capital grants, consider the operating transfers in from the other funds, it will still be a positive. It'll, it will wipe out the, the net loss for, for the transit. So all the enterprise fund ended the year on a positive balances. Um, internal, balance, internal service fund also reported a positive net position of 12.4 million, which was an increase of 4.1 from 8.2 million. So overall, a very good operating results for, for the city. Any questions so far? So for the required communication to those charged with governance, um, as far as um, management responsibility, management is the one responsible for your financial statements. So all the numbers in the financial statements, all the note disclosures, the application of the auditing, uh, application of the accounting standards is really the management's responsibility. Um, account consultations with other accountants. Uh, we are not aware that management consulted with other auditing firms with regards to accounting or auditing standards. We did not encounter any difficulties with management. Um, in fact, they were very responsive. Um, whenever we requested documents or additional information uh, from management, they were very uh, prompt in providing those documents and we could see that they really understood the operations of the city. Um, as far as significant accounting policies, um, there were no um, accounting policies in, you know, significant in controversial areas or any accounting policies that lacks um, authoritative guidance. Um, the city only um, implemented one new standards during the year, which is the GASB 96, but it did not have any uh, significant impact on your financial statements. I think as of um, year end, the impact would be around 100,000 in, in assets. As far as significant unusual transactions, uh, we did not identify any significant unusual transactions. For independence, while we are independent of the city, um, it's really a shared responsibility between the city and the auditors. So in cases where um, management or maybe the city council uh, knows of some instance that would impair our independence, that uh, we would ask you to immediately inform us so we could you know, um, do something about it. Or maybe if worst case scenario, then we have to resign if our independence is impaired, but it's really a shared responsibility. Um, audit adjustments, there were no proposed audit adjustments made to the original trial balance presented to us uh, before we begin our audit. So this is always something that you want to hear. If there's no audit adjustment, it means that whatever numbers management is presenting to the council, it means that you could rely on the numbers, you could rely on the internal reports being provided by management in making your decisions. And we are not aware of any uncorrected misstatements other than misstatements that are clearly trivial, meaning not significant to the financial statements.
as far as conditions for us being retained as the auditors, we are not aware of any significant issues that we've discussed with management for them to retain us as the auditors. As far as fraud, irregularities, or illegal acts, um, nothing came to our attention while we were performing that, uh, the audit that would uh, um, require us to um, communicate that to the city council. Management representation letters, these are a letter that we ask management to sign prior to us issuing the, the report, meaning they take responsibility for, for the reports. Um, so that has been provided to us by management. And the management letter comments will be issued um, to management, but nothing significant, some IT improvement comments, um, some policies and procedures to be improved, but um, nothing really uh, material or significant that would affect the operations of the, the city. So here are um, the new accounting pronouncements effective for next year as well as fiscal year 2025. And as I mentioned, um, some of this was really just redefining the definition of accounting changes, error corrections, um, some um, disclosure requirements for financial guarantees and some changes to derivative instruments which doesn't really apply to, to the city. And then two years from now, um, the compensated absences and risk disclosures uh, will be implemented. Any questions for me? <laughs> Mayor Pro Tim Rhodes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to thank the Vasquez team for um, the, the great report and the thorough diligence that you did. And I want to apologize for making your job so easy and boring. <laughs> um, and that's my yes. sideways way of, of complimenting um, our crew, our, our people, our staff involved, because uh, how many years running is the, uh, the audit award? So many. Yeah. So, and that's, that's just what an incredible achievement. Um, what it does for uh, council is that we can actually then read the report and trust the numbers. Yes. Now, it's got to be frustrating. I had a, uh, a food service industry, and when our auditors showed up, they did not leave until they found something. <laughs> and uh, so um, I, I appreciate your diligence in doing that. Um, there was some question in our, our financial position of having so, many, so much more uh, assets involved on the balance sheet. How much of that is like one-time grant funds? The, mm -hmm. It, it looked like there was a, a really large increase, but how much of that was grant funding? Well, the ARPA fund ended in 2023. So you have five, around five million that was left mm -hmm. of the ARPA fund that's going away. So you don't have that in the right. 2024. Right. So um, if I, the, the synopsis that meant the most to me resonated with me was mm -hmm. our expenses were down yes. and our people were paid more. <laughs> and that, that's what I heard in, in the report. So, um, uh, and, and our financial position is strong. So, yes. Um, um, I don't have any other specific questions uh, for the for the audit team. But again, thank you for that you. that detailed report. Thank you so much. Councilmember Lister. Thank you, and thank you, Linda, for being here. We've seen you on Zoom. <laughs> I think in the past, and it's fun to see you here in person and to see. The, the real person behind the, the, all the comments. Um, I, I just want, wanted you to maybe give me, a little, give me a little more understanding about the CalPERS um, yes. assumptions change mm -hmm. that has all of a sudden made our liability seem so much larger. <laughs> um, is that a trend? And I recognize that's yes. your job. As the auditor, it's not your job to, to <laughs> use a crystal ball and project, but is... Um, is this something to expect in the future? Are you seeing it elsewhere? Could you maybe just comment about that? Well, they're actually reducing it further, uh, the discount rate, but not as much. Um, previous years, it was 7.15. They reduced it to 6.9. And I think they're further reducing it to 6.8. So just 0.1. But it's still going to increase your net pension liability next year. It will still affect your... Um, net pension liability as far as the discount rate is concerned. But uh, we're hoping 
2023 would be a better market, you know, um, environment because 2022 that was when the market was a little bit down. So um, if you look at um, the valuations provided by Calpers, from being um, net investment income in the previous five years, suddenly it was a loss uh, for 2022. But 2023, uh, we'll see the numbers. We're expecting a, a better number, but we'll see. Oh, we haven't received that yet. Understood. Well, thank you. Thank you for your thoroughness and your presentation, all the work for the city. Much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Councilmember Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of, uh, <clears throat> just a comment or two. Um, being somebody who's been on both sides of the audit, um, thank you very much for a very detailed and comprehensive review of it and, and putting it in a way that we can all understand and are comfortable with, with the responses. And also congratulations to Carolyn and your entire team on another great audit. I know you guys work extremely hard to keep all this tip top shape. Plus you've had some conversions lately that you've had to go through too. So just want to compliment Vasquez and Associates as well as our team. So thank you all. And I think all my questions were answered, but I do want to thank you for a job well done. And of course, heap much praise upon our staff and the job they do year in and year out. Keep us in good shape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item four, public statements. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, since there are no public hearings under agenda item five this evening, agenda items four and six are combined and the City Council will hear all public statements under this agenda item four. Agenda item number four and six are the times allotted for public statements on all items other than public hearings, appointments, and informational reports. Speakers will be called on in the order in which their card was submitted to speak for this public statements item four for a period of no more than three minutes each. Persons addressing the city council are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Mr. Mayor, unless you have any comments, we can begin public statements. Thank you. The first speaker, Brad Washburn. Good evening, uh, city council members and, and mayor and pro, uh, mayor pro tem roads. Um, uh, my name is Brad Washburn and uh, I am a resident of Simi Valley and a resident uh, in the Greek track, if you're familiar with that area, uh, one of our older uh, neighborhoods. Um, I've been there for about 15 years now. I've been a, a resident of Simi Valley uh, since 97. Um, my concern is uh, being a runner and a biker and doing that on a regular basis is I like to uh, recreate in the Arroyo um, and uh, am thankful for the uh, improvements and upgrades that have been made to the river um, as far as the bike path. Um, I think we just had a rib ribbon cutting uh, just recently um, for the new section around the Tapo uh, Canyon area and uh, love being out there. I really enjoy it. I love recreating. Uh, I see lots of families. I see lots of people out there enjoying it. Um, but I also see the underside of our bridges, specifically our Madera Bridge uh, being the worst and our First Street being the second worst and uh, LA Avenue at Third Street being the third worst. Um, if you walk under there, um, you'll be hit in the face with a smell that is very distinct. Um, I, I'd like to thank our police department for what they do there. Um, it seems like a thankless job. It, it's never ending, um, and I understand where it comes from, and I understand the societal issues that are involved in that, and there's a hundred different stories for a hundred different people. Um, I can't solve that problem. I don't know how to address that problem, but I know how to clean things. I know how to pick up trash. So I am here to volunteer my services um, in regards to some type of a royal cleanup, which I see occasionally happen around the Erringer area, but it doesn't make it down to the west side for some reason. Um, the, the constant um, unhoused, people unhoused, I think is the way we talk now, 
Um, it, 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 it just, it, it never ends. It's a revolving door. And um, as soon as the police come in and do what they have to do to flush them out, they're back um, within 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, I don't know what we can do to solve that, but I would urge all of you to walk over there and look instead of see pictures and hear about it, to actually walk over there and look and go under those bridges to see what's going on because it is a cancer that is growing uh, on the underside of our city. And I would like to see some type of cleanup done um, ASAP because I think if we start there with the cleanup and then the citizens and the city and the county and anybody else that wants to go under there and volunteer their time, um, we'll be able to maybe make some progress. And that's all I have. Thank you. Edgardo Rivas. Uh, good evening, members. I like, my name is Edgardo Galileo Rivas, and I like to start with Ms. Lester thanking her the letter that you sent me and referred me to three different individuals that work here. But it, it was a waste of time, you writing me that letter to me, because I'm still experiencing bad corruption in the city, the detective departments, which you already know that I was, uh, uh, the detective department wrote a letter to me, no, not, not a letter, but told me verbally, Gonzalez, uh, Tecada and his partners that I'm running Dr. Xi's office. So that's, we're not done with that. That was last year, and I'm gonna continue with that. Mr. Rhodes, my dog got poisoned. Last time I was here, you were all by yourself. That was the last meeting. Nobody else was here but you, and I wanna thank you for being here, for me. But uh, Mr. Thomas, he's into real estate, Let's hope Mr. Gabler, when he retires, I can't wait until he retires in June, we get a better manager, a better chief of police, better detective uh, investigators. I spent two times in war against communism, and that's what I'm experiencing here, especially with you, Mr. Thomas, Mrs. Lester, and Gabler. He's been here too long. I've been here too long. And I'm not going to permit communism to enter into my life in City of C. My dog got poisoned. The police department, he didn't get poisoned. He got bit. They're making medical reports and decisions on my behalf. It's serious when my dog is being poisoned and nothing's being done by the detectives, Thomas, and the chief of police. I think enough is enough. What do you have against me? I'm not moving out of Simi Valley. We've been here since 1542, Carrillo. 1542, and I'm not leaving Simi Valley. I want to fight communism. If I have to, if I have to go one and one, I will. When I'm saying one and one, I'll come here and talk to you one and one, like Mr. Rhodes had the privilege. The last meeting, he was by himself. Lester did not show up. Thomas did not show up. And I'm not going to deal with Mr. Ford. You refer me to speak with him. He's new at this case. The chief of police been around because he's been appointed, and he appointed Mr. Ford. I'm not going to waste my time. I am not wasting my time after my dog got poisoned. And you're District 3. No. Enough is enough. I don't go around knocking at doors and putting people against you, against Thomas. I don't do that. But I will let you, I want, I want to let you know what I'm going to do. I'm going, to put, I'm going to write down, get an editor, and I will write my experience with this gentleman here, Gabler. You guys talk to each other very friendly, but he represents the city, the people. 
but I'm being treated like I'm fighting a war, like Vietnam, El Salvador. And that's what I am. I'm against communism. And I'm not going to be tolerating and tolerating. You got, well, not Mr. Rhodes, your corruption, Mrs. Lester. You asked me for tithing. Gabler, he never calls me. We need somebody like, like Mr. Levitt. We don't need somebody like him. And I encouraging you guys, when you hire a new manager, hire somebody better than Gabler, better than the lawyers. He was controlling Mr. Cassis, that he knew about my case four years ago. He stopped him. Not you, Mr. Rhodes. Not you, Ms. Lester. Not you, Mr. Thomas. Not you, Mrs. Didi, if you don't mind me calling you Mrs. Didi. This is enough. Look the way I came. I'm trying to show you that I've been to two active wars against communism. Excuse me. I honestly, I. I know you don't I, like it. I know sorry. you don't like it. We do have a time limit. You're well, already well, two minutes well, you know over, what? and You're there's nothing I can do uh, about it. Okay, why don't we put this in the agenda? Because I'm not going to resolve it with Mr. Ford. I'm not going to resolve. You guys represent the people. I haven't been here since the last time I was with Mr. Rhodes. He was by himself. Why don't you be a man? Be a good man and represent the people. People like myself. They've been to two wars, and I'm being treated like communism. That the police department making uh, reports like they're doctors. The detective bureau telling me that I'm running. Uh, this, uh, well, you want to kick me out? I, I'm leaving right now. The detective bureau I tell me that I'm running Dr. Xi's office. No. And I want to straighten that out next meeting, Mr. Rhodes. And I want to thank you for being here. And I want to thank you for the last meeting. You were held by this And I want to thank you. Anthony Angelini? This would be the time. Tough acts to follow. Uh, uh, honorable mayor, council, staff. Um, first and foremost, I, I know there have been rumors. I'd just like to say that I had nothing to do with council member judge's absence today. <laughs> We have, have our differences, but I have a rock solid alibi. And um, second, and in all seriousness, um, I would like to say thank you uh, for the support and the guidance that Mayor Thomas and our assistant city manager, Linda Swan, have provided me throughout my transition into the role of tourism director for the chamber and the city. With the mayor and Ms. Swan's assistance, the team at the Chamber of Commerce has gained back the trust of our hotel community. And for the first time since the tourism district was formed, we have earned the unanimous support of all six of our local hotels. This is, I believe, a mandate to lead, and not only that, but a show in the confidence uh, of, in the future. It's not an exoneration of the past by any means, but rather it is proof that the changes we have made and the commitment to transparency and the relationships we have developed have been steps in the right direction. In no uncertain terms, the tourism district has elevated the profile of Simi Valley to a worldwide audience. There uh, was this um, little festival about a little house on a little prairie. I don't know if you maybe heard about this, but before this festival, the tourism district was given a uh, directive to supplement the marketing outreach, to supplement the hospitality efforts of the hotels, and, um, quote, to see if we can hit that coveted 10,000 person number, end quote. Well, not only did the city see that number, but we surpassed it with an estimated 14,000 guests at a single event in the city. And this, I'm told, not only, uh, well, it actually moved the needle of Simi Valley from a small market to a mid-sized market and could affect everything from recruiting sports tournaments here uh, to doing similar festivals to doing bigger concerts in the future. 
There are a lot of opportunities here. And we need to stand up and support the institutions that are making them possible. If you believe that Simi Valley's best days are behind us, then by all means, when the vote comes up on number eight, vote no. But I'll tell you that this council has already committed time and again to making investments in our city. And they've largely lived up to those commitments. Simi Valley can have a bright future. Our hotels believe this. Our business community believes this. And we are asking the council to believe this too. Do not hold your nose and press the button to vote for this. You should be very proud to vote for this. This is exciting. Supporting this tourism district means that you believe that Simi Valley's best days are ahead of us. And well, I look forward to helping you as we make those days become possible. Thank you. Kathy Van Ethan. Good evening, Mayor Thomas and council members. I am Kathy Van Etten and I am a lifetime resident of Simi Valley and a very proud resident. I'm also the president and CEO of the Simi Valley Chamber of Commerce who just recently um, brought the Little House on the Prairie event to Simi Valley, which was a huge undertaking for the chamber, but it was a huge opportunity for Simi Valley. Um, I wanna thank you for the, the special event grant that you've gave. I want to thank Mayor Thomas for being a judge in our food contest. Looked like he was having a really good time, which everybody had a really great time. We are getting stories of how life-changing this was for so many people, and it's in our own backyard. This festival was the first one out of the gate for, for the 50th anniversary, 2024 year, and we hit the bar, we set the bar high, and we hit the mark, and they've been to a couple festivals since in Kentucky, and I'm like, how was it compared to ours? Nothing compared to ours. We had the, high, the, the largest um, gathering of cast members, and we just have to thank all of our volunteers who just stepped up, and we're just so excited to be here. We have had um, or visitors from six continents. We did not get Antarctica. Uh, Eileen Connors is helping us with that on, on some other things we have coming down the road. This is the 50th anniversary year. We are not finished with this event. We plan, we, I think we've all been kind of, um, we've drank the Kool-Aid now. We all knew it was going to be a big event, but we didn't know how passionate these fans are. Um, we have the interior sets. We are going to continue doing something in Simi Valley because we know it's going to attract people here for tourism and to fill our hotels. And we're just very proud of, of everything that we were able to, to do. And we thank the city for the support. Um, we couldn't do this without, uh, you know, without you guys, without our, our great staff. I know you talk about your wonderful staff. We have a wonderful staff as well. But I just wanna thank you for the opportunity and, um, and also invite you to the street fair on Saturday, May 4th. We do not stop at the chamber. We're constantly working. So um, thanks for listening. Katrina Maldonado. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. I'm from Newbury Park by way of my grandparents since 1953. My name is Katrina Maldonado, and I am the Development and Community Relationships Coordinator for the Autism Society. And I'm also a member of our Advocacy Committee. So I'd like to thank you for the proclamation that acknowledges Fair Housing Month. At the Autism Society of Ventura County, we're emphasizing the importance of fairness, inclusion, and justice in housing. It's vital to remember that discussions on diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, often miss a crucial report, or excuse me, a crucial group, people with disabilities. Disabilities don't shield anyone from poverty. In fact, many people with disabilities live in abject poverty and never graduate out of poverty. 
Not everyone fits into the group home setting that our local regional center offers, yet this is the most common option and offer for people with de developmental disabilities in Ventura County. With at least 10,000 individuals with de developmental disabilities in Ventura County, we need to ask, how well are we housing them? What programs are there? Who is their advocate when housing is discussed? Are their needs being considered? Are they being met? And are their needs being planned for? It's time to focus on universal design and reserved housing set-asides for people with developmental disabilities. While Oxnard has been a champion for housing, it's important for our planning departments to note that being accessible means more than just accommodating wheelchairs or physical access. It's about making spaces comfortable and usable for everyone or are universally designed. We hope to work together for a future where everyone in our community has a place that they can proudly call home. Not just month, but all year round. Thank you for your time and attention. Mr. Mayor, that was the last speaker. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 4A, City Council comments regarding public statements. Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. I didn't know I was going first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, last first. Oh, she just left. Uh, <laughs> I was going to comment to Ms. Maldonado that um, uh, thank you for for making the, uh, the presence here and uh, talking about um, this particular group. Um, housing is a tricky issue no matter what, um, but uh, if there are ways that we as the, uh, the city and our facilities are less than accommodating for that particular group, I'd like to learn that. And I think we do a really good job and, and we can always learn and do more, but thank you for being here. Um, uh, Mr. Washburn. Um, uh, you're, you're not alone. We, uh, I've, I've walked the Arroyo, I've been there, I've, I've met the, um, some of the uh, inhabitants, residents, if you will, under those bridges, and it is an issue, and it is a problem, and we just did our point in time count, and so we actually know the, the size and scope of our, our problem, and uh, getting those people to resources. As you said, um, you can move people into resources and then a space becomes available and there's a, there's a, a vacuum effect. But um, figuring out how we can deal with that better to make it uh, a place and a space for everyone that's comfortable, I think that you're right on. And uh, know that it is top of mind and it is, is something that we, we are working on. And if you haven't used the other end of the Arroyo with the, uh, where we did the ribbon cutting, Please go up there and do that. Um, let's see. Um, I'm not sure how to respond to Mr. Rivas. I'm not even 100% sure of the uh, meeting that he was referring to um, where I was present and others weren't, but um, I, I hear his frustration. Um, then, let's see. Mr. Angelinski, is it? Angelini. Oh, Angelini. Angelini, okay. Uh, we'll see. That's all I have to say about that. And, and, and Kathy, you, you said the chamber did this. I'm not sure what a tourism department did for the whole little house thing, but we'll see. We'll see. That works. Thank you guys both for uh, being here and making the presentations, and, and thank you for that fantastic event. And I, I didn't know we were going to be going, ongoing, and that's kind of fun. I look forward to hearing what's next. Council Member Litster, please. Thank you, Mayor. Actually, I will, Kathy, thank you. Thank you for what the Chamber did. That really was incredible, what, what took place. And the numbers of volunteers that you had to marshal and use, it was just really overwhelming and just, just truly, truly outstanding. Um, I learned many things. I had, for instance, the set that she's referencing, I understand there were not actual blueprints, but I learned that they had to go back and look at the height of Michael Landon, if I'm not mistaken, how he measured when he was standing there, and based on that ratio, were able to reconstruct sets. I mean, the attention to detail is truly magnificent above and beyond, so I 
look forward to how that is permanently ensconced in Simi Valley. I know you're working on that, but I, I just think that that's exciting. Um, and later I'm going to talk about all the musical fun things that came out of that, but that, that'll be later. Um, and yes, uh, Ms. Maldonado, uh, who was gone, thank you for bringing and reminding us of the needs of a group who obviously need you to speak on their behalf and us as well. Mr. Washburn, um, thank you for being here. I, I often bike that section, and it, what's interesting is you, re you first began by referencing the odor, and it is absolutely prevalent, and I guess I sometimes don't stop to think about what that really means in the big scheme of things, and so thank you for reminding us of what that means, um, and you're right. Every time there's been a cleanup, they kind of start Erringer, and the, and by the way, the Greek track is in my district. And I, I'm going to talk to the people about the cleanup. I think it's done through Rancho Parks. They tend to be the ones who oversee that area. But I, it would be nice to start at, at the West End and, and work th that way. So I, I concur with that. And it's a difficult, difficult pro problem. Um, and again, sorry for Mr. Rivas and his, his difficulties. So Anthony, look forward to discussing your issue later. We'll be talking. So th thank you. Those are my comments. Councilmember Kevin, I'm basically just going to repeat everything they already said. They took all my thunder. No, Sorry. thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Washburn, yes, I remember the Greek track. I played softball there as a little girl of many, many years. So um, it's been around a lot of, a lot of years. Um, yes, the Arroyo Simi is basically uh, managed by the Rancho Simi Park and Recreation Department, but, and the county, because it's county watershed. So, yeah, we have to throw the county down there, too. But I know as, as the city and the park district and the county and our PD, we work together to, together to, to go in there and, and try and do our, do our cleanups and to offer services to those that need them. So I'm sure that will be on a continuous basis. Right, Chief? Yes. Well, well, I know there's always something. I know there's always something being worked on and discussed. Let me put it that way. Okay. Okay. Yes, there we go. And, and they're carrying stakeholders, which is, which is a really good thing. Um, as for uh, Ms. Maldonado, yes, this is the first time I remember having somebody from the Autism Society come to Simi Valley. So I was really nice. It was nice to hear from her. I personally have uh, my best friend's grandson who's autistic, so I'm around it quite often. And so it's nice to have, I know we have Gigi's coming, that's really come in for our Down syndrome community. So it's nice to maybe have some Autism Society uh, recognition here in Simi Valley also. And for our wonderful five star chamber. Um, I missed the event because I was out of town for spring break, but I saw pictures. I saw our mayor, pictures of our mayor, and I believe Councilmember Lister setting chairs up or actually working and volunteering. You were probably there too, Mayor. Yeah, but I saw pictures of them. But no, it looked like a wonderful event. Um, I actually saw Michael Lennon in person once, and I was like flabbergasted. And I was like, oh my God, this little house on the prairie. So I, I know it's a big deal. Mr. Angelini, I'm not sure about you, but we'll get to that. No. I'm curious. <laughs> I'm very excited to have you uh, leading the tourism part of our of our chamber. So looking forward to that. So that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, Mr. Washburn. Absolutely, I believe we've already had a couple of conversations on this. I think you know the initial was to try to prevent something permanent from establishing, and now we're trying to figure out how we're going to keep it clean. So we are working on that. Um, tourism. Little House on the Prairie. I can tell you that a year ago, uh, Little House on the Prairie was a big question mark for me. Um, tourism, I was um, a little critical of, maybe a lot. <laughs> uh, now it's a year later. Uh, little House on the Prairie was an absolutely amazing event. I met people from all over the world. I spent my time going around introducing myself and talking to them, their experience, what they thought you know, what brought them there and so on. And I mean, it was just, people were so passionate. There were people getting emotional talking about it. So it was amazing. Um, job well done. It was just an incredible event. Um, tourism. Um, I actually feel really good about what I've seen lately. And I guess I really can't go more into that because we're going to be discussing that item. So, but uh, thanks. I think that's it. I'm still confused about the Little House on the Prairie success. I, I just, it's amazing to me. <laughs> I have lots of questions still. But. 
Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item seven, the consent calendar, and there is one resolution for your consideration this evening. Consent item nine, resolution number 2024-07, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley approving program supplement number A479 to implement citywide pavement delineation project number CRASL-5405102. I'd like to move uh, approval of the consent calendar. Before we move the entire uh, calendar, I would like to just quickly discuss the library um, award. And that is, is that six? I've got to find it. Yes, six. Could we, the van, could we just pull that for a second? And then. I move uh, approval of all the consent items except for six. Second. Call for a vote. The motion passes unanimously. So thank you for letting me pull this item. Not, not that there's any questions about it, not that I'm, in, well, there are questions, but 100% supportive of it. What I wanted to bring to the attention just in discussion is that I'm so impressed that Lynn C. Egler, Egler, excuse me, that her estate gave a, a significant amount of money to our library and that part of this is to use that generous donation to help make this um, van, a po this mobile library a possibility. And I just wanted to actually say that out loud, that thank you to a resident that would be so generous that would allow this possibility. And so as I read through the report, I was, I was going to say, should we name the, van, the library van after her? But as I read uh, more in depth, it, it suggested that there'll be a plaque or some way of recognizing her and her family. But that's all, I just wanted to make that comment that I think sometimes people are generous and, and never get acknowledged. And I just wanted to say that out loud, that, that there's a lot of people doing many great things for our city. And this is a permanent thing that will benefit residents for years and years and years to come. So thank you. So, okay, so now I will motion that we, that we please, that we, that we approve motion, item six. Second. Call for a vote. The motion passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is continued business item 8A, second reading of ordinance number 1355 for City Initiated Municipal Code Text Amendment Z-S-2023-0005 to amend portions of Title IX of the Simi Valley Municipal Code to establish development standards and modify design guidelines for residential accessory structures and a determination that the amendments are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. The reading of the ordinance is as follows. Ordinance number 1355, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley for City Initiated Municipal Code Text Amendment Z-S-2023-0005 to amend portions of Title IX of the Simi Valley Municipal Code to establish development standards and modify design guidelines for residential accessory structures and a determination that the ex amendments are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt ordinance 1355. Second. Call for a vote. Council Member Cavalier? Yeah, it cleared. <laughs> yeah, the I motion know. passes unanimously. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 8B, receipt of petitions from Simi Valley Lodging Businesses requesting to renew a tourism marketing district Consideration of adoption of a resolution of intention to renew a tourism marketing district and fixing the time and place for a public hearing to establish the new formation of a district. The reading of the resolution is as follows. Resolution number 2024-08, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley 
declaring its in intention to renew the Simi Valley Tourism Marketing District, SVTMD, and fixing the time and place of a public meeting at a public hearing hereon and giving notice here thereof. And Assistant City Manager Linda Swan is here to present this item. Well, good evening, Mayor Thomas and City Council. Before you this evening is a request to renew the Simi Valley Tourism Marketing District. So the city created the Simi Valley Tourism District by resolution in 2014 for a five-year term and subsequently renewed the district in 2019. Uh, the term of the district is set to expire on June 30th, 2024 and the lodging businesses have decided to pursue renewal of the district through submittal of their petitions that are in front of you tonight uh, for a term of 10 years. So the district raises through an additional charge on room nights, a 2% assessment of gross short-term rental rates at lodging locations within city limits with all proceeds spent to increase business to those lodging businesses. The district provides a revenue source to help fund marketing and sales promotion efforts uh, for Simi Valley lodging businesses, and it does provide a stable funding for source for tourism promotion. So following the protocol outlined in the 1994 state law to form a district, there are a series of steps that the city council will need to take should they choose to renew the district this evening. So the first step in renewing the district is for the city council to accept the petitions from lodging business businesses and adopt a resolution of intention uh, to form a district. Petitions must be received from more than 50% of the lodging businesses. In this case, before you this evening, you've received 100% of the lodging businesses. They've submitted their petitions requesting the district's renewal. So this action is under consideration this evening but this action does not bind the city council into forming a district. So now if you adopt the resolution, tomorrow staff will notify all of the business affected by the formation of the district. We will do that certified mail. Next step is to conduct a public meeting tentatively scheduled on May 6th to receive comments from the public regarding the reformation of the district. And we will need to introduce an ordinance to renew the district for the levying of the assessments. And then the final step is to conduct a public hearing, which is tentatively scheduled for June 3rd and allows lodging districts, to, or lodging businesses to protest the formation of the district. So if less than 50% of the lodging businesses protest, then the city council can move forward. They would adopt a resolution of formation and then conduct the second reading of the ordinance renewing the Simi Valley Tourism District and levying the assessments. So attached to your, your staff report is the management district plan, which is required by the Property and Business Improvement District Law of 1994. It serves as a governing document for the district. The Chamber of, Contract, the Chamber of Commerce, excuse me, is contracted with Civitas, Civitas Advisors, who has extensive experience in forming districts and they've been involved with the Simi Valley Tourism Marketing District since inception. So it is recommended this evening that the City Council accept the signed petitions from the Simi Valley Lodging Businesses and adopt resolution number 24-08, declaring the city's intent to renew the Simi Valley Tourism Marketing District and fixing the time and place for a public hearing to consider establishing a new assessment district. This concludes my presentation. I am available for questions. Mr. Anthony Angelini, representing the chamber, and Gina Reed from Civitas are also available. Council Member Lidstrom. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Swan, for your presentation. And um, in full disclosure, I had a meeting earlier last week with Mr. Angelini where he answered questions about this. Um, my question, um, Linda, though, is, is the recommendation, it's been last two times, has been five years, and now to go to a 10-year renewal process. In your estimation, is that a, a healthy standard time frame? Is that normal? Is that excessive? Is that, uh, any, any comments? 
I, I don't think it's abnormal. Um, it has been done. I think maybe city manager Gabler might want to respond to this because he's the one who was involved in creating the district in 2014. It's strictly at the option of the city council to approve it. Um, I think that if there is a desire to continue the funding pattern uh, and to provide for the marketing funding and promotional opportunity funding for the um, for the community as well as the lodging institutions, then a 10-year term makes sense. Well, and I have to admit that when I first was visiting with Mr. Angelini, it wasn't clear to me that it was his idea or the the business the uh, the represented uh, lodging groups. When I understood more clearly that they're the ones that that are willingly signed 10 years, then that relieved my concerns. Because I, I do want to be sure that we are doing diligence on our part in, in monitoring, being sure that the funds are spent fairly and, and appropriately, et cetera. Um, but I think it's quite a comment that all 100% of them were, um, have agreed to recommend this district and to go forward at 10 years. That was not the case last time, just to, I'm sure you saw in the report that it was actually one of the larger ones uh, did, chose, didn't, was not in support. But anyway, so, okay, so I understand, thank you. So 10 years is not, um, not, <coughs> not unusual, not inappropriate. Not um, and I, I just, just for the lay people, would you explain the difference between the transit occupancy tax versus this district? I realize there are two completely different things, but as I was reading through, I just, I thought it's kind of good for people to understand the difference. It, it, the, the assessment from the tourism, dis go ahead, Gina. Gina, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce Gina from Civitas. Hi, good evening, Mayor, City Council members. So the difference between the transient occupancy tax and the tourism marketing district is that, as you know, TOT goes back to the city can be used at the discretion of the city, typically used for fire, safety, um, things of that nature. Uh, TMD is a special assessment district, and it must be spent. It, it's legally required to be spent to benefit those that pay. So those that pay here are the hotels. So it is specific, it's providing a specific benefit that others are not receiving. Yes, there's gonna be spillover benefit to retail restaurants. Obviously, residents benefit from increased visitation, but um, primarily the funds are used to benefit the businesses by funding those sales and marketing efforts. Thank you for sharing that. I just think it's good to be understood by all. Sure. sure. So thank you. That's it for my questions. Council Member Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question is more really for Anthony and the, the chamber. So I know in the past we've had a council member express concerns about the high dollar balance in the tourism account. And as a banker, I kind of concur with that a little bit. So our report shows we're going to have about 400000 coming in annually. We have almost double that already in the books or close to it. So what I would like to see is more of a rounded budget. We need to start spending that money too. It doesn't need to be sitting there. I don't want you to spend all of it, but I would like to see. I would like to see the four hundred thousand spent every year. Is is really what I'm wanting to see because that's what we're giving you to spend on the tourism. So that's really what we should be we should be cycling through. We have the other money. You may have something special like like Little House on the Prairie, some some big event that we can use a chunk of that for or something along those lines. But that's my only concern is I would like to see that utilized and spent a little bit more often. And I think with Anthony leading and having the chamber and Kathy behind you, I think you'll have the opportunity to do that. Well, thank you, and you're absolutely correct. There's a uh, very large surplus right now. Um, we are trying to spend it down. I will be honest, I may not be the best person to, to recklessly spend taxpayer dollars. <laughs> Um, I'm, I like to be very careful before I spend anything. So I, that has been actually one of my main struggles, is the people in the know about government tell me, spend down your surplus. They're not going to give you any more money if there's any money left over. And um, that's just not how I operate. I want to make sure that every dollar that we spend is an investment in the city um, and is going to uh, the mission. Um, and so I, uh, I will say that I echo your concerns. Um, they were my concerns as well. Um, and we are taking steps to address those concerns. One of the steps that we took very early on was to bring on a, 
I wouldn't say a, a major marketing firm, but a, a um, aggressive boutique marketing firm based out of Ventura County, uh, or, or based in Ventura, with uh, run by a local um, Simi Valley High School grad, <laughs> and a uh, uh, developed an entire marketing plan that I've shared with the hotels and I've shared with the board of the hotels. And if that plan is uh, sawn to fruition, it will spend down the surplus and we will be in a healthier position. Perfect. I don't, you don't have to spend it all. Just bring it down. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, rest assured, nobody wants you to <laughs> randomly just spend the money <laughs> without purpose. Um, Could I ask one more, yeah, one more question, please, if that's all right? Huh? Um, it was interesting to read the history of, of, of these districts with, within our county and elsewhere in the state. Um, many of them are combined. For instance, on our, in our West County, there um, are combinations of cities, areas, part Wayne, New York, et cetera, I think were combined. Um, has there been any discussion about maybe combining with more park? I, I'm not saying that I'm advocating that. I'm just, it's a curiosity. Um, that, would, that would be wonderful. In the time, previously, they, they didn't have a hotel, I might add. I, since the last time... I believe we, there we, is one hotel in Moore Park, but there are, you know, Underwood Farms, and there are, there are plenty of things that we could use as marketing that would bring people into the region in general. Um, and I've kind of been avoiding using because, as much as I would love to, you know, only advertise, you know, not only advertise, but advertise Underwood or um, um, some Moore Park, Moore Park College, um, things like that that may bring people into the region. It's just, it, it, it's not it feels iffy if because, you know, they, they, maybe they stay in Simi, but maybe they stay in Newbury Park. But if we had one tourism district that can bind them, and I think that that would be a great idea, and I think... So I like what we have right now with Simi Valley, but then the question yeah. becomes, in a year or two, can you modify it? Or is it... So if that were a desire yeah. of, of this body. Okay, thank, thank you. Yes, Thousand Oaks has Visit Conejo, and Conejo encompasses Agora, too. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilwoman Litster had uh, my first question, which is why 10 instead of 5? Um, and I think that if the um, hotels were uh, good with that idea, what's good for the hotels is going to be good for Simi Valley. And they've met you, so... <laughs> <laughs> It's on them, I guess. Um, so um, what I'm concerned about, and I kind of heard us uh, moving around this, this topic in terms of moving forward success, what are the metrics for success, one? And then the other one is, what kind of reporting mechanism can we expect so that we don't end up in the um, position that we've been in a predecessor to yourself? Great. So um, w when I was meeting with the hotels, um, those concerns were also echoed. And um, one of the things, I won't say it was a negotiation, but one of the things that I agreed to was um, overwhelming transparency, um, especially for one of the major hotels that historically did not want to sign. One of the um, reasons that they signed was because I said, well, we will, we will Continue, we will continue to address these financial issues and we will do them publicly so that everybody can see what these issues are as they come up and we can address them in real time. We agreed to uh, publish uh, brief financial statements in the minutes and we agreed to quarterly um, present our financials to the city manager's office. One thing that I, that I think would be a great idea to maybe include in the management agreement that we will make with the chamber moving forward, and that won't be included in this, but it will be in, included in our contract, will be every year to have an independent um, CPA do our, an audit of the books. Um, and I would be more than willing to, to justify that and say that that is um, part of a, a method of maintaining a healthy system, not just because I, I'm involved, but because whoever's next will we'll inherit a system that's healthy and ready to move forward. As for metrics, you know, they, when I first came here, I said, I said, uh, well, you know, if the room occupancy 
is higher and the average price per room is higher, then that means we're, we're successful. In reality, it doesn't work that way. There may be one hotel that ruins the, the average for everybody else. Um, but I think, that, I think that transparency is going to go a long way in, in uh, those, me those metrics. We, we already will public, publish our um, social media numbers to see how good we're doing there. We will, pub we will publish the results of each QR code on all of the ads that we do, which is a new thing that we just started doing. Um, and we will attempt in every way to hold monthly board meetings, although there has been a struggle with getting a quorum. Uh, I think now with more buy-in from more hotels, I think that they will be more excited to get more involved. Um, and that's as much as I can promise as far as that. Can I make a final comment? Go ahead. There, we have a tourism area down in Ventura, and there's a gentleman that does all the numbers for all of the hotels. So is that something you'll be able to supply us with, the yes. data? Good. Because I'm always asking him, well, what about East County? Well, I don't do them. So it will be nice to hear. We subscribe to, hear to it. It's a, it's a, you have to pay for it. Some type of program? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That'll be fun. Thank you. Yeah, so... What was important to me is, you know, transparency and how the money's being spent. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to see was uh, major expenditures be something that goes through the approval of the board prior to actually being committed. Um, I will say the direction we've been going, establishing a marketing plan, setting a budget for it, it's working right. The things that have been going on the past couple months is exactly what we need. Um, no. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Mayor, then I'd like to move that we accept the signed petitions from Simi Valley Lodging Businesses and adopt resolution 2024-08 declaring the city's intent to renew Simi Valley Tourism Marketing District and fixing the time and place for a public hearing to consider the district's uh, Second. Call for a vote. The motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item new business item 9A, accept the subgrant award from the Board of State from the Board of State and Community Corrections, BSCC, and the County of Ventura Sheriff's Department for the organized retail theft ORT prevention grant. Ratify the execution of the subgrant agreement. Approve the request to hire one full-time limited-term officer, funded through reimbursement of salary, benefits, and ORT-related overtime. Authorize the city manager or designee to sign all the necessary documents, and approval of a supplemental budget request for funds 287 and 100. And Assistant Chief Purcell and Chief of Police Shorts are here to present this item. All right, can everyone hear me now? Let me start over. <laughs> Good evening, Honorable Mayor Thomas, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes, and our esteemed members of the City Council. Thank you for having us tonight. And uh, not to regurgitate everything that was just said, but before you is a request to have the City Council authorize the Police Department to accept that sub-grant award of up to $975,000 from the Board of State and Community Corrections for the Organized Retail Theft Prevention Grant Fund, ratify the execution of the subgrant agreement, approve the request to hire one full-time limited-term police officer that will be funded through the re reimbursement of salary benefits and related overtime, and authorize the city manager or designee to sign all the necessary documents and approval of supplemental budget requests of 975,000 for funds 278 
and 100. And before we dive into that, I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of a presentation just to kind of explain what it is exactly that we're looking for. So with that, the Ventura County Organized Retail Theft Grant Program was provided by the Board of State and Community Corrections. And to give you a little bit of a background, in 2014, California enacted Proposition 47, which was known as the Safe Neighborhoods and School Act. And some of the things that came about Prop 47 uh, is it reclassified several nonviolent offenses and increased the property value threshold for theft-related crimes, specifically for shoplifting. It was one of the biggest ones that came out of it. It increased the threshold for grand theft from $450 to anything that exceeded $950. Since that time, California has experienced an increase in theft-related crimes. Specifically, we've seen an increase in organized theft, uh, I'm sorry, organized retail theft. And there was a recent article, and I wanna say it was in the Ventura County Star, but I'm not entirely, I don't remember exactly, but it, they estimated that Ventura County loses nearly $10 million every year due to organized retail theft. So the overview, in September of 2023, the Ventura County Sheriff's Office was awarded approximately $15 million in grant funding by the Board of State and Community Corrections to form a countywide organized retail theft task force. This grant covers fund funding for 44 months, starting in October of 2023 of last year, and will end December 31st of 2026. The Simi Valley Police Department is one of eight law enforcement agencies in Ventura County that will participate in the Organized Retail Task Force. Below listed, you'll see Ventura County Sheriff's Office, Oxnard PD, Fort Wyneme PD, Santa Paula PD, Ventura PD, Ventura County Community College PD, and California State University Channel Islands Police Department are those that are gonna be participating. So what is covered? As I said earlier, it's up to $975,000 and available funding by reimbursement over the life of this grant. That includes salaries and benefits for one dedicated full-time investigator, that includes overtime, a dedicated vehicle for the assigned investigator, which also includes fuel and maintenance of that vehicle, overtime funding for all member agencies, meaning anyone who's participating in this task force, for a minimum of 75 high visibility uniform patrols per year throughout the county. It also includes the use of up to six automated license plate readers that will be dedicated to Simi Valley. It authorizes the creation of a retailer slash public education program focused on theft mitigation and reporting. And it also allows access to additional advanced equipment and technology. So how it works. The Simi Valley Police Department is providing one detective to the task force effective this month and therefore that will qualify us for these reimbursement funds. The Simi Valley Police Department will provide quarterly invoices and other associated reports to the Ventura County Sheriff's Department, and the city will be, in re will be reimbursed for those activities in arrears. In order to offset the loss of one detective, the city will hire one police officer on a limited term basis. When the grant funds are exhausted, the number of sworn officers will return to the current 2024 quantity through natural attrition of sworn officers. So with that, Again, I would like to request that the City Council authorize the Police Department to accept the subgrant awards of $975,000 from the Board of State and Community Corrections for the Organized Retail Theft Prevention Grant Fund, ratify the execution of the subgrant agreement, approve the request to hire one full-time limited-term police officer, funded through the reimbursement of salary, benefits, and related overtime, authorize the City Manager or designee to sign all of the necessary documents, and approval of a supplemental budget request of $975,000 for funds 278 and 100. And with that, that concludes my presentation. And I am here, available for any questions, along with the Chief of Police, as well as Sandra Hernandez from the Police Department. Mayor, Mayor Pro, Pro Tem Rhodes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Assistant Chief, you did an excellent job of giving me a, a good uh, clinical background of that, and you're, you took politics out of it. I'm going to put some politics in. Um, so the problem gets created by Prop 47, and um, we're going to we're going to do less incarceration, um, and uh, hopefully in reduce incarceration costs, and then we're going to raise the amount of the stolen goods amount to get incarcerated, 
and then we hopefully lower the amount of criminality. And the result was more crime and organized theft. So now we have that. To, so to fix this idea, we're going to create separate funding, <clears throat> more costs, to try and dissuade the crimes from happening. But still, the dollar amount of the threshold of criminality remains the same. So Prop 47 is still in place. Um, we might as well just hire our seniors to hang out in front of the stores and say, hey, you kids, get off our lawn. Because it's, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure the, the logic of uh, Prop 47. And it was totally misguided. And hopefully, we can change that for you. And we'll come back to that. Um, that being said, any addition of officers dedicated to this growing problem is something we need. And, um, and uh, I'm fully in support of, of taking this funding and doing the same. But here are some questions. Um, I'm involved with Southern California Association of Governments. And for years, we worked on putting together programs to, for transportation and housing and homelessness and, and the like. And we got them all ready. We started issuing grants and funding. And with the budget crisis this year, they've said, oh, by the way, you're only getting half of that money. So my question on this grant money is, does the money already exist? Is it in a position to be clawed back? And if so, uh, what do we do with now our temporary new hire officer and the person we've dedicated to this program? So thank you very much for your question, as well as your assessment of Prop Proposition 47. Um, I'll leave that at that. Yes, my understanding is this funding is currently available, and as with any grant, to your point, it absolutely could be pulled back at any time. That's just the nature of government. Um, with that, and in the contract that's been proposed, um, obviously at any time, if we have to dissolve the task force because funding dries up or is otherwise not available anymore, uh, we would revert back to the attrition as far as our officer being able to hire. That's specifically why the verbiage is the limited term. My understanding of that is essentially with that, uh, we wouldn't hire behind that person. And then obviously as officers retire, which they do, or otherwise you know, move on with their career, we just would not hire behind them back to our normal staffing numbers for 2024. Right, and just, just to add to that, keep in mind that people are matriculating out of the department all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we constantly have vacancies. We're constantly hiring. Uh, we have uh, people retiring. Uh, you know, so that's just the normal uh, that's just the normal sense of what we're normally doing. So uh, I don't think there would ever be a problem with absorbing any limited term positions. Yeah, and as you know, we don't want to spend long term or create long term positions on short term money. But that sounds like a, a good exit strategy for that one. And the only other question I had. So let's let's hope. Somehow, common sense prevails and Prop 47 uh, gets repealed or changed uh, for the better. This program now is still in need, right? Do you think that the funding would still exist? Uh, or do you think that funding would go away if Prop 47 changed? Well, based on what we're watching with the state, um, who's in the process of closing more state prisons, I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, because AB 109 realignment still exists, Prop 47 still exists, unless at some point there's some uh, legislation that amends it. You know, we always believe, we, we're, we're pretty confident that there's gonna be the uh, a possibility of a piggyback grant on this. Thank you both for the uh, presentation, the information, and I, I support this. And I think a task force is the only way to really put a big bite in this. Is to be have a group of people totally focused on this because that's what it's going to take, it, you know. Rather than you know getting a phone call and happening to be in the right area, this way we can actually have a strategy and, and make a real difference. So I think it's a good idea. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Litzter. Thank you, thank you, Assistant Chief Purcell. Appreciate your report. Very good. Appreciate you both being here. Um, just some logistical questions. I'm absolutely supportive of this. Um, do you see this, would this be a new hire or is this going to be a promotion within the department and then someone else gets brought in just to, to, to get the numbers where they need to be? 
Are you referring to the limited term officer or just? Yes, the limited term officer. I'm sorry, is, it, is this, would there someone be in the force right now who would like to step into that spot and then we hire someone else to kind of backfill? I so, so what we, uh, I appreciate the question. So what we've done is we're going to assign a detective to the task force, which then creates that vacancy. Got it. Within the detective unit. Presumably someone will want to promote into the protective unit, which will create a vacancy at a line level officer. That's where we plan to fill that limited term officer. At per the, essentially as a new hire. Perfect. That, 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 that makes sense. Thank you. And, and this is maybe just another uh, question of statistics. You gave the, the figure of 10 million last year in, in uh, organized retail theft for the county of Ventura. Do we have a guesstimate on what that looks like for Simi Valley proper? I do not. Um, I can tell you our businesses have been impacted significantly by it. Uh, we are very fortunate here uh, within the city of Simi Valley in the sense that we are extremely proactive mm -hmm. when it comes to these. And we actually have a significant closure rate on catching people that come into our city. So much so that we've actually heard from people that they were like, yeah, they warned me. I shouldn't have gone in to see me. <laughs> which we you wear as a badge of pride. You keep that up. We like yeah, that. We <laughs> absolutely do. Very so. much. As far as an actual number of, of loss, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have that. I apologize. So this position will not negate the responsibility of the in-house detectives that work in property crimes to work these cases. Uh, something to keep in mind when you're talking about narcotics, when you're talking about organized retail theft, um, there's, more, there's more offenders and there's more cases to work than there's actually law enforcement officers to work. So um, we are fully engaged in a in a in basically a full court press on property crimes on a daily basis, including the weekend. There's there's a lot of work to be done. So what this is is an extra layer. It's a regional group. Um, it allows us to have extra resources and access. Uh, uh, excuse me, resources and 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 personnel to spool up fast, to react fast, and kind of try to uh, try to be more aggressive in, in doing the investigations. Excellent. Well, thank you, Chief. I, certainly this is something we'd, I would want to support, absolutely. <coughs> are we ready for a motion or? Y yes, we are. Should I read it exactly as you did, which was beautiful? That was a... <laughs> I'd love I'll, to read it one more time if you want. I, no, I've, I've got, I've got okay. I, just say moving on. I, I, I was already, a move, okay, I move the recommendation that you so eloquently read. Second. Second. <laughs> Call for a vote. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 10A, City Council Member Reports. Councilmember Lister. Thank you. This is, um, there were a few weeks since we've last met. There might be a few things to chat about, but I'll try to be relatively brief. Um, thank you. I should start. Thank you, Mayor, for your presentation on March 20th with the State of the Union. Well done. Um, I thought that was a fun photo in the acorn of you there, uh, but back in the wings. But anyway, it was good to attend the State of the City and, and appreciate all those, um, Samantha and others who worked on that, and your mayor, all of your efforts with that. Uh, much appreciated. Um, March 21st um, began the Little House on the Prairie weekend, didn't it? And that was lovely to attend with, se with several of you here that uh, behind, the, uh, well, actually, not on the 21st. I didn't do go there, I'm sorry, but on Friday morning, um, it, it was the initial ribbon cutting of the Little House on the Prairie and then subsequent events throughout the day. What I wanted to share, we've talked about Little House on the Prairie um, quite a bit t tonight, but one of the things that came out of that, and I wanted to personally commend Joe Metcalf and Katie Garibaldi, who have, who have been the brainchild behind Simi Valley Orchestra. At one time it was named something else, but they officially announced at the Little House on the Prairie event that it is officially formed, there is it will continue, there is a, and, and we can thank Little House on the Prairie for that, but there is officially a Simi Valley Orchestra, in fact, as we speak, they are forming a 501c3 to make it 
to go forward to make it happen. What I particularly appreciated too is it truly was a community orchestra in the sense that anyone in the community who wanted to be involved played an instrument and all of the music that was performed was arranged or composed by people in the orchestra. And so there was, um, anyway, very, very, uh, quite a range of music that was done and it was just a, a and it, they performed twice, on both on, on Friday and on Sunday, uh, or excuse me, on Saturday, I've got to get my dates right. It was Saturday and Sunday, wasn't it? Anyway, Saturday, the 23rd and the 24th. So, uh, bravo. Um, for, bravo to all who were involved with that. On Monday, March 25th, I attended the swearing-in ceremony. Thank you to our police chief and com accommodations to Megan Liddy, Ryan Kalan Kalinowski, and Trenton Lindig, who are all promoted lateral police officers into our force. It was good to be there in attendance for that. On Tuesday, March 26th, um, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes and myself attended the Simi Valley Arts Commission meeting where we had a budget review and seemed to be in a good, strong financial position. We also discussed scheduling. And because the um, our bylaws have changed a bit, we, it, these meetings are becoming more robust. And so there was a discussion of how to better schedule our time so that we could truly address some of these new areas that, that we are are going to be exploring. Wednesday, March 27th, I want to thank Ms. Uh, Councilmember Dee Dee Kavanaugh for being out of town, which allowed me the privilege of attending the Women in Networking and being the speaker there at the luncheon. I confess, um, it, 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 she was the one they wanted, they got me instead, but it was um, it was a very lovely gathering and I really appreciate the, uh, the work they're do doing. And I, I had no idea that they, that it's existed so long within our community, harking back to the days of Rotary Club when Rotary Rotarians were only men. And so this was the female counterpart creation. But it, what a great group of women. On Thursday, March the 28th, um, I attended the ribbon cutting uh, sponsored by uh, the Arroyo Simi Greenway, which Rancho Simi, well, uh, Rancho, why do I always do that? Rancho Simi Recreation Park. I look at Dee because she gets the name right every time. She just, Rancho, anyway. Uh, it was a lovely event to celebrate that, I believe, the fourth leg. Uh, it is beautiful. If you haven't ridden it, there's some cutouts now that are so important to get you through things in addition to the beautiful paving. So, uh, And they have more to come, so appreciate that. Friday, March 29th, I attended the grand opening of Dollar Rent-A-Car. Yes, we have a Dollar Rent-A-Car, which is on L.A. Avenue. Um, anyway, it, uh, it, a group, a great group of, of people who are now working there, and it's right there in the the whatever that mall is called on LA Avenue next to Little Caesars in that area anyway. But um, excited to be here in Simi Valley. March 30th, attended the Elk installation. Congratulations to Council Member Mike Judge. Um, loved Easter on March 31st. Um, then we get into April. Um, on April 4th, uh, yes, I attended the SCAG Regional uh, Council and Policy Committee, or excuse me, I attended the Energy and Environment Committee, I'm, but I'm going to leave um, that whole discussion of SCAG to um, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes, who will give you updates on that. It was good to though, be with the mayor for the check presentation that Congresswoman Brownlee uh, did here, it, where she basically, also on that afternoon, presented funds for the Bernard Street widening and bridge uh, improvement, and so appreciated that grant uh, that was received, that she, the funds that she provided for us. Um, also attended the VCOG committee meeting um, to schedule some things there. Um, and I think I'll go forward to next week. Let's take you into April 8th through 14th. Yes, I was one of those that followed the eclipse and flew to Texas to, actually it was my husband's desire and sometimes we support our family members. But it truly was w wonderful to see to see the total eclipse and um, it's just a, a it really amazing and was, uh, just amazing how it can, how it literally it goes dark, completely dark. The crickets started chirping, thinking it was nighttime, and then let there be light. It, it's, it was very, a great experience. Um, on, again, on April 10th, I visited with uh, Mr. Angelini, who we spoke about that event. Um, on Thursday, April 11th, 
I was invited, and I wanted to share this with the, with the council, by Megan Marshall, who is the executive officer of the California Interagency Council on Homelessness, Consumer Services, and Housing Agency. Basically, um, Sinaloa Middle School, there was a group of students that wrote letters with all sorts of questions about homelessness and what the state is doing about it and how things can be better handled, et cetera, et cetera. And the letters were so compelling and, um, and, and, and deep in their inquiries that the director, executive director, felt it important to fly down from, from, from Sacramento and speak to them directly. Uh, and so she had about a two-hour assembly at Sinaloa Middle School, and she invited me to, to join her. And so it was very interesting to hear about all of, uh, of course, the, the, the broad story of what's being done, and then, of course, the, the young people had questions about what we are doing here in Simi, Simi Valley as well. And that's where maybe I didn't say 211 and gave a different three-number thing, but now I'll, I'll correct that and make that, um, make that accurate. But... Um, it was clearly our youth are very interested and concerned, and it was interesting to have her here. This was right after the audit that came out. You may remember in the news that lots, seven billion in funds have been given out. You might remember that in, on the state level and the accountability was very sparse. Lacking is what, yes, I'm trying to be generous, um, was, was not there. Um, I will say to Megan's credit, as I and I and she, it's interesting. A student brought up that question, and she actually clarified it and said, "Let's talk about that. You're probably talking about this in the news." And then I talked about a little bit more with her afterwards. She has been in that position about a year and a half, so many of those decisions that were made uh, were before her um, arrival. What she did share, though, was that certainly a lot of the money was given in the height of COVID when it was just get the money out and help people, and they really did not make any requirements like project room key, et cetera, to, to monitor how many received it, what the effectiveness was, what that meant in terms of long-term housing. Those, the money was given out without any of those requirements. That has since changed, and, and so going forward, hopefully there will be better results. Um, but she acknowledged that there were mistakes, and she acknowledged that the rec recommendations of the audit, all she agreed with all of them, and they're going forward to be much more accountable. That doesn't really answer, though. Uh, basically, there's a lot of money that they will never know with certainty that it was spent correctly and well. So, But anyway, that was a very interesting afternoon spent with uh, Ms. Megan Marshall, and I commend her for coming to Simi Valley to, to speak to the students. Um, Friday, April 12th, I, I, right before I ran to the airport to fly to Idaho to see my parents, I did have to attend the pass and review at Royal High School because it is so inspiring to see what the junior ROTC do. And it didn't, it was lovely as always. They truly are, are inspiring and, and we are in good hands with our, our youth and what they're doing and, and training to, to become and to be good leaders. And so that ends my report. Thank you. Councilmember Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mine's going to be short because I was out of town a lot of it. <laughs> um, I also attended the uh, State of the Union where our mayor did a wonderful job. And uh, it was attended by, we had a full house, so it was great. And it's always very informative. And it's uh, school district was there, park district was there, uh, as well as a lot of community members. So great job, Mayor. Um, and thank you to Assistant City Manager Sam, Sam Argerbright, because I gather she uh, put that together and did a special thing by using the video. And it was very fun. We have a movie star in our mayor now. So he did a great job. Um, Thursday, March 21st, I had my EDC board meeting down in Camarillo. And I will verify that Interface is located in the Verinteri County Community Foundation building because that's where EDC is also. So I see them there all the time. Um, the following weekend, the March 23rd, 24th, is when spring break started. So since we don't have a back bay, I was down at Newport Dunes for the week with the family. Uh, I know it was, not, it was a good time. Um, I did want to thank the Rotary Club of Simi Valley for lighting the cross for probably the 40 umph year. I, I don't even remember how many years we that club's been doing it. Rocky and I actually both belong to that club, um, but it's a wonderful community community event. And if next year you want to go up there, just you know, reach out to one of the Rotarians and we'll help assist and have you come up and visit us. It's a unique place if you've never been up there. Even during all of the year, the view from up there is just fantastic. 
But uh, if you want to drive up there, you have to have special permission. So um, come up with a Rotary Club member. You'll get up there easier. So I was gone that whole week. And then um, on Wednesday, April 3rd, we had our EDC Executive Board meeting. Um, and then, oh, I got an electric bike. So they're dangerous. Um, so if you see me running around town, please forgive me if I fall in front of you. <laughs> but uh, it, it was a lot of fun. So I got that because I just spent the last four days, um, well, five days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, with 220 high school students. They are our future. Um, Ryla, Rotary puts on a youth leadership awards camp, and I've been doing it for multiple, multiple years. And we had, this is the biggest group of students we've ever had. In my opinion, they were one of the best group of students that we've ever had. Um, we made them go without their phones for four days, and they didn't complain. We take their phones away and don't give them back till the end of the session. And I asked them, did you miss them? No, nope, it was actually kind of nice. So uh, it was really a good time, but it, our future is great in, in that fact. Um, and I come home exhausted from that, so I took today off. So that's the end of my report. <laughs> Mayor Pro, Pro, Pro Tem Rhodes, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to take Mike's time because I've actually got a lot. <laughs> um, so Tuesday, March 19th, I attended the ribbon cutting for the new farmer's market up at Adventist Health in their northeast parking area. And this yeah, is going to be a farmer's market ongoing stuff. on Tuesdays. So please go and check that out. Wednesday, March 20th, um, uh, uh, a grad student uh, uh, named uh, Doris Torres uh, interviewed me for her master's project about um, works in the city, which was a very interesting conversation. And I also attended the State of the City, and I'm digging the new format. And, uh, and I think we got a lot of information out in a uh, compressed amount of time. So it was good. Thanks, Trevor. Thursday, March 21st, I attended the League of California Cities Policy Committee um, where they had they had two things. They had the main seminar. We heard from our lobbyists uh, of Cal Cities at a high level of what they're watching. Mm -hmm. um, the most egregious bills continue to try and take local control away. And there are a couple of good bills that will make governing a bit easier, and we're watching those. And an important takeaway I got was that bills requiring more spending were likely to die given the horrible state budget. So that's kind of a, a good way to pump the brakes on more spending, is just not have any money. Um, uh, so there, there was a discussion on artificial intelligence and how it could be used in municipalities, and that within five years it will likely be developed or deployed in many areas of the city, so we should be planning for policies and protocols now. Uh, we also discussed SB 252, which is where the state could demand that PERS and STRS divest of all fossil fuels. Um, aside from the fact that it goes against the state constitution, it would probably and it would likely uh, significantly diminish the returns of the retirement program. It would cost every taxpayer more because we have to make up the difference if the, as we saw in our our report today, if they don't make their uh, predicted numbers, we as the taxpayers have to make up the difference on that. So they were looking for um, two things uh, from the, the committee that I'm on. One is to um, oppose the bill as a whole, which we all did, but then they offered up a, um, a second um, sort of a compromise, and they said, um, what we'd like to do is uh, recommend that uh, PERS come up with a two- uh, fun solution, one with fossil fuel and one without, which, again, is kind of a horrible idea. And I actually had to then um, listen to all the arguments, stand at the end, and just try and put some common sense in. Uh, it was not a unanimous by any choice, but we did win 1912 to not go that route and just um, uh, defy SB 252 as a whole. So that was, I think, a victory. Uh, Friday, March 22nd, I attended the opening day ribbon cutting of Little House on the Prairie. And yes, I was there setting up chairs, just out of camera, out of camera view. Um, and uh, that, that was absolutely mind boggling, the, the attendance. And uh, um, I, I shared with others, I watched it when I was little and it was cool. 
I haven't thought about it for 50 years, but um, that, yay, go Little House on the Prairie. What a great boon for our city. And congratulations to the uh, chamber uh, for pulling that off and sticking with it and, and seeing the vision that I don't have because that was really a successful event. Um, Saturday, March 23rd, um, it was uh, close to the last weekend of the PADS program, so I was a monitor and slept over. If you're not familiar, this is a place where our homeless population has the opportunity of getting out of the cold and not sleeping under uh, the bridge, but actually can be inside, get a meal and a, uh, and a warm bed for the night. We do that during the five winter months uh, to take care of those. Um, and uh, I want to thank the Samaritan Center and specifically Val, who ty tirelessly volunteers for that every year to make sure we have all of the uh, organization and volunteers. Uh, da -da -da -da. Sunday, March 24th, I attended the final performance of Parade at the Cultural Arts Center. I want to congratulate the director, David Ralph, who is a, a member of our Rotary Club with uh, Councilman Mediti and um, the Cultural Arts Center for pulling off a, a, an amazing headcount um, for the entire run. Uh, many sold out performances uh, and uh, that just shows that people are now back to the theater and that the uh, Arts Center staff are doing a tremendous job of marketing and getting people uh, into seats. Um, Monday, March 25th, I attended the swearing in of the three officers that Councilwoman Litzer uh, mentioned, and congratulations to all of them. Welcome aboard. Tuesday, March 26th, I attended the Simi Valley Arts Commission meeting and uh, well managed and run. Thank you very much. Um, the, and we did the uh, mid year budget review of that, and uh, as Councilwoman Lister, uh, uh, alluded to, there's more responsibilities now for that group, and so more meetings, uh, a change in meetings will be, will be needed. Tuesday and Wednesday, the 26th and 27th, um, I participated in the cross lighting up at Mount McCoy. Um, and this is an open to everyone event. If you notice during the Holy Week that the cross, it lights up at the top of the hill, um, that just happens to be some uh, camaraderie and fellowship of Rotarians running up a uh, little light and a generator and um, and we we sit and talk and have fellowship up there and you're all welcome to come. Uh, Thursday, March 28th, I attended the Arroyo Simi Greenway expansion ribbon cutting, which is super exciting and uh, I hope that maybe one day we'll continue it all the way to Corriganville. Um, not yet. Yeah. Yeah, one at a time. One at a time. <laughs> um, Friday, March 29th, I attended the graduation of my son from the Universal Technical Institute. And congrats, uh, congrats Dangerous Roads. Yes, that's his name. And, uh, and uh, in June of this year, he's going to be going off to NASCAR Mechanic School, and Dad is pretty proud. Um, Saturday, March 30th, I attended Councilman uh, Judge's installation uh, as the exalted ruler of the Elks Lodge. So congratulations. That's a big job, and uh, he's going to do great. Um, then we came to Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. On Monday, April 1st, I was given a brand new Ferrari for being Councilman of the Month. There you go. Did I mention it was on April 1st? Okay, so um, Tuesday, April 2nd, I sat in on the meeting with our planning folks and the management company for the Runkle Canyon Woodlands uh, Complex to see what they're thinking to move that project forward to a conclusion, and I think it was a productive uh, meeting. Thursday, April 4th, um, this is the, my, my downtown day. So at SCAG, they have the Community Economic and Human Development Committee, of which I'm a member, and I am now, I was elected uh, vice chair of that committee, and so I'll be in that role for the next um, year. The, uh, there were informational reports, one on tribal needs assessment and another on how to simplify the ADU development process in your town, um, which is both good and scary. Uh, the, the SCAG Regional Council meeting, we approved the final Connect SoCal 2024 plan, including the program uh, environmental impact report and um, uh, just the, the the, the grain of salt there is all the programs that we're all excited about 
the funding is likely to be reduced by half, and so we're going to have to come up with Connect SoCal 2.1 or something. Um, uh, after those meetings, I went to the Clean Power Alliance, and um, uh, we had a very robust discussion about 100% clean energy cost, availability, and rate setting. Um, for Simi Valley, I'm happy to say that Simi is one of our one of the few common sense cities, and we've remained at the level called lean. Um, lean, when you were opted in to there, if you didn't opt out, please know that you have saved money every single month over what it would have cost you from Edison. Yes, your prices are going to go up um, as a result of all prices going up and the dealing with whatever the uh, the new delivery fee is going to be is something that the Clean Power Alliance has to uh, deal with as well. Um, later that night, I rushed back uh, to see me for a Paul Harris dinner. And Paul Harris uh, for Rotary is that gala event is something that we can bestow what is our highest level award for individuals within our communities and our lives. And I was uh, honored to give a Paul Harris Fellow Award to the person who keeps us all in line here at City Hall, Miss Sue Klepper. Um, and then I also gave one to some guy who's going to retire, who's given years of dedication to our city, Mr. Gabler, and thanked him for his years of service, well-deserved. And I noticed you're wearing it proudly on your lapel, and I appreciate that. Um, Friday, April 5th, I drove up to Sacramento to visit my father, who will turn 99 this July. And I only mention that because on Monday, April 8th, I represented the city presenting a certificate to Mary Moffat on her 100th birthday. And I asked her if she was looking for a younger man of 98. And uh, um, I, she was not. She was not. Um, uh, I also thanked her on behalf of the city for her many, many years of being a taxpayer. <laughs> All right. That, they laughed at Ivy Park anyway. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, that is the end of my report. Thank you. I will say you look good for 98, Rocky. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Uh, Tuesday, March 19th was the uh, Community Projects Grant Review Committee interviews, which we uh, presented tonight. Uh, Wednesday, March 20th, uh, State of the City. Um, the change of, uh, of how we did that was... Uh, really driven by the fact that last year it went so long. And I'll say that there were three speakers and I was the one that wasn't at fault. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we did manage by doing it the way we did to put a lot of positive information about what we're doing in the city in a very controlled period of time. So I thought it was a success. Um, Little House on the Prairie. So... Thursday, March 21st, I attended the uh, media event, which was twofold, a very interesting thing. I got interviewed by, I believe, four different international TV crews, and then got a chance to take a tour up to the site with the actors from the show and listen to their own stories about, oh, that's where we did this, and that's where we did. So it was, uh, was kind of cool. And then proceeded to spend Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the event itself. And just, I, I, it was contagious. I couldn't help it. I, you know, meeting all these people, I just went around and just met everybody I could and just loved the event. It was really great. Uh, let's see here. Monday the 25th, uh, I attended, uh, let's see here, a, a tour of Santa Susana Field Lab uh, with the Department of Energy. Uh, you know, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to be able to answer, with, you know, more precisely, you know, where, where we're at. Uh, it's been a real controversial, controversial issue. Um, but I got to tell you, I was really impressed with what they had to show. Um, and, you know, I continue to meet. I've met with uh, NASA. I've met with Department of Energy. I've met with um, Boeing. And, you know, all of them are taking this very serious, uh, you know, with highly trained individuals. And, and basically requesting of the state and the federal government, tell us what you want, and that's what we will do. So um, it was very interesting. Um, 
Let's see here. March, Friday and March 29th uh, was when I met with Boeing. Uh, let's see here. It's like a long period of time here. All right, Thursday, April 4th, uh, met here uh, with Con Congressman Brownlee to receive uh, funds to uh, rehabilitate uh, uh, the um, Bernard Street Bridge. I thought, Anyways, it was definitely needed. Um, Saturday, April 6th. Um, is that right? Yeah. I um, ended up uh, going over to Slice House Pizza, which was formally opening their first day that day. And there were so many people there that it took over an hour to get to the order desk. And it was nonstop. It never stopped. So anyways, congratulations to them. Let's see. And then Saturday, April 13th, I attended the Boys and Girls Club dinner up at uh, the Reagan Presidential Library. And it was a very successful event and an organization that I've supported for 26 years. <laughs> Anyways, that is it for my report. So, uh, I'm going to ask for any future agenda items. Seeing none, then I'm going to have a motion to adjourn in the name of Brett Taylor. He is a Ventura County Fire volunteer for 48 years. I know he recently became a volunteer with the Ventura County Sheriff's Department and was a self-declared uh, uh, self um, se mayoral security detail for me. <laughs> um, also want to adjourn in the memory of Karen Zilman. Want to adjourn in the memory of Michael John Sorensen, Ann Sorensen's brother. And I want to adjourn in the name of Gail Gibson, Gail Gibson Sean Gibson's mother. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Good night, and have a good night.